there's just like this deep like self-loathing that a lot of Americans have, especially American progressives, and it just seems to be being ratcheted up, 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 and up. I hate to use the word like post-truth because uh, I'm pretty sure people have been saying that for like a hundred years. Yes. But I really just feel like we have completely abandoned any notion of truthful things. You do, though, have a lot of conversations with awful people, don't you? A very healthy, important disposition that we should all go through life with is like, think about what I don't know. What do I not know? What do I not understand about this world? And what can I do to correct that ignorance? And so many people just don't have that disposition. Or if they do, they just want to go for like the, the shortcut to knowledge, right? And I think that's why conspiracy theories are so attractive, is conspiracy theories like the anti-mainstream media, you know, the mainstream media does nothing but like write lies, right? Like these are like shortcuts to knowledge. I got an email once from a guy that was super interested to in me. And he said uh, he has a theory for why uh, politics has gotten so crazy. And he calls it, I think he called it the magic box theory. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to Bridges episode four. Today I am joined by JJ McCullough from Canada, of Canada, a Canadian politics YouTuber that actually manages to talk about Canada. It's incredibly rare. It is incredibly rare. I'm one of the one of the very few, maybe one of the only. So as an American, it really does seem like you guys export the worst. <laughs> <laughs> do do people? Okay, here's like a general question. Yeah. I live in the United States, okay? Yeah. My country is very loud in yeah. every sense of the word. Yeah. And I can't imagine living next to a country like America because I feel like it would drown out everything. I think when you guys had your Canadian, do you remember the big truck protest? Yes. I think some of those guys had American flags on their trucks. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that was Americans that drove up or Canadians were like, I feel so patriotic, I need to put a fucking American flag yeah, yeah, on yeah. here. To well, I mean, particularly, I think, on the American right, there's, a, or sorry, on the Canadian right, you know, there's a lot of sympathy with America. There's this kind of narrative, I think, that exists very prominently in both the U.S. and Canada, that, like, Canada is, like, the progressive country and America is, like, the right-wing country. And in the same way that I think a lot of American sort of progressives kind of, like, idolize Canada as the country that has everything figured out, a lot of Canadian conservatives sort of idolize America and see it as, you know, the country that has the right answers in a way that Canada doesn't. And I think that that accentuated a lot during the sort of the overlap between Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump on both sides of the border. Yeah, I remember the classic handshake showdown <laughs> where I think a good two weeks of our political discourse was dedicated to what that handshake would look like. <laughs> and Trudeau came in with the gripping the elbow and doing the handshake yes. and uh, Jesus. Um, do you think it's fair to say, I don't know if this happens in Canada, but in the United States, uh, people have this idea that the Overton window in the U.S. is like here, and then like for the rest of the world is like here. Hmm. So people will say shit like Bernie Sanders would be a conservative oh. in, in Europe, or Bernie Sanders would be like a almost far right and yes, blah, blah, yes, blah, yes. or he'd be the absolute center in Canadian politics. Yeah. I, I, hate, I hate that narrative because, you know, the thing is like Bernie Sanders, I think, is, is radical by any stretch because what he's advocating for is a radical sort of disruption of the status quo, so to speak, in American politics, right? So mm -hmm. when he talks about something like, you know, his Medicare for all system, right? Or like the idea like, oh, America should have Medicare for all. He's basically talking about upending the entire uh, American medical or Medicare healthcare regime and replacing it with something new, something radical, something, you know, that is unprecedented and very unique, right? And that would be radical in any country, right? It would be radical to say, let's tear up the existing a healthcare system and replace it with this new idea that I've dreamed of, right? That that sort of like attitude towards the healthcare system like does not exist in the Canadian political discourse. You know, you can say that we already have a more Medicare for all like system, although even Bernie's proposal would be to the left of the Canadian status quo. But the case is, is that, you know, people on the left in Canada are basically just defending a system that already exists. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, like dispositionally, they're arguing from a sort of conservative place, right? They're saying we have this system, we have the Canadian Medicare system, it's good, let's protect it, let's not mess with it in any way, either from the left or the right. And actually, that's, I think, one of the big problems with the, the Canadian sort of healthcare discourse is how like conservative in the bad sense it is, how kind of close to any sort of conversation about reform it is, right? So, you know, if Bernie Sanders was in Canada, I think just knowing dispositionally the kind of person he is, he would probably want to be allied with the furthest left faction in the same way that, you know, I think that any Democrat you bring into Canada or Europe or anywhere else, like their sort of political instincts are to identify with the more progressive tradition. And obviously every country is in a different stage in terms of a sort of legislative 
you know, initiatives on this policy or that policy. But if your basic disposition in life is to sort of fight for progressive change, then I think you're going to ally with whatever progressive party exists, right? Not kind of go at it with just like, well, let me find the party that most closely resembles the Democratic Party on every policy issue. And that is the party I'm going to support. Yeah. I think he's going to shout at you. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. A little bit closer. Um, these are weird. You have to talk like right into yeah, them because yeah. uh, we try to filter out that I'm air sorry, I, get, I get too animated when I'm talking. Yeah, clearly. Um, the, there's a lot of specific stuff we're going to talk about. So I can ramble about any of these topics for a long yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, I feel like people moralize every single political term or every single political word. Yes. So when people are talking about the air written window yeah. or what's acceptable in their country, it's not really an actual analysis of where the politics are at. It's more just an analysis of like what's acceptable and what I think is good. Mm. So when people talk about how, you know, well, the Overton window here, Bernie would con be considered like right or centrist. They're not actually expressing the idea of where his political positions would be. It's just like how good or not good they would be. Yeah. So like Bernie Sanders is the start. Like he's not, we could go way more socialist than that. Yeah. So Bernie Sanders is like a centrist because he's not the goodest he could be, which yes. would be like Karl Marx, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. And it feels like that for a lot of different political things. Uh, we, we get into this a lot with like Israel and Palestine, but, but really with the whole political spectrum that, uh, or, or with every political issue that every statement now, every word has just become a way to moralize or bring in some normative baggage uh, in order to bolster your side or attack the other. Another good example is like, were the Nazis left or right? Yeah. And it's like, in the grand scheme of things, who actually cares, yeah. right? But it's really important because I don't want them to have been on my team. Yeah. So they say socialists are actually on the left. Okay, well, they did this, so they're actually on the right. And it's like, yes. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's the same with like the endless litigating of it, like, well, you know, Mao was actually worse than Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what is the point of that discourse, right? The point of that discourse is not to actually like objectively adjudicate which 20th century tyrant was worse. It's to kind of, in some sense, like, and this is actually quite disturbing when you think about it, that there's like some faction of sort of modern conservatives that in some way feel like Hitler is like their guy or like is a representative of like their side. So in some sense, like you have to make the communists worse than Hitler because in some way like you're doing defense for yourself by doing that like that's really kind of creepy and kind of unsettling but it does sort of show like the excessively sort of moralistic and and the way that people are ident it's the same thing with it's like um the other one of these kinds of things that I hate is when people are like well you know like the democrats were the ones that supported Jim Crow and that kind of thing like to bring that up you too, know yeah. like sort of failing to understand like a how much the parties have changed but also like that in those days Nobody who was fighting for Jim Crow was sort of saying like, yes, this is the good progressive thing to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. There's actually a, a good interview that I saw not too long ago on uh, archived on YouTube between uh, William F. Buckley and uh, I think it was George Wallace, you know, the, okay. the Democrat governor and they of uh, Alabama at the time. And they were having a, like a debate as who was the better conservative. And like he, as like a Southern Democrat governor, did not have any problem identifying himself as a conservative and sort of saying like, I am fighting for the side of like the more regressive side of the political conversation at the time mm -hmm. you know which yeah but they, i mean i don't think they would view it that way right i was like i'm a regressive no no no. but it's like <laughs> yeah. no but like in the context of that like it, it wasn't seen as weird for like a, a democrat to sort of be allied with oh. the conservative side of the political spectrum and sort of see himself as fighting for tradition and blah, 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 mm -hmm. right and it's and it's like even in our own lifetime like if I were to go up to a Trump supporter and say something like, oh, well, I know that you really support big business and you want a lot of foreign intervention. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, you did under Bush. Right. And it's like, this is a totally different yeah. conservative party. And that's like eight years removed. Yeah. You know, so w what are we talking about? What we say, well, 50 years ago, the Democrats wanted this or 60 years ago, the Republicans was like, who cares? Like that, mm. this has nothing to do with anything. Um, and then that thing you brought up about like people, it's weird what people feel like they have to defend. I remember feeling it was so strange when, did you ever hear about the game Wolfenstein? Yeah. yeah. When Wolfenstein came out and a whole bunch of conservatives online were really mad about like all the Nazi killing or whatever. And I'm like, why, why is this your, <laughs> like what, somehow what, why, what, what, what are you even saying right now? Like, why would you be offended by this? This is somehow part of the woke agenda. You know, they're trying to push anti-Nazi games down our throats. Yeah. It's so bizarre to me. Yeah. I, like, I feel like you could release like Saving Private Ryan today and people are like, oh, cuck virtue signaling. Like we get it. Like you kill. Not. I don't know. It's just, it's so, it's so bizarre. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't like that in the United States, when we talk about, you brought up healthcare. Yeah. People, progressives in the U.S. idealize the f of your country. Yeah. It is unbelievable. Yeah. And it's so funny when I have like a Canadian friend here talking to an American and especially if it's an American progressive and they're like, oh, like 
your guys' healthcare is so awesome. Like you can go into any hospital you want at absolutely no charge for anything you want and get like treatment and blah, blah, blah. And then you, usually the other person will give you like the messy realities yeah. of like, well, it's not always free. And sometimes you got to go long ways away. Sometimes you have to wait a really long time. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, yeah. Um, much the same, I guess. I imagine like conservatives in Canada probably idealize aspects of American culture too. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I think the guns is a big thing, right? Like there's, I mean, because like the here, here's my my big thesis, Stephen, is okay. that at the end of the day, I I don't think Canada and the U.S. are very different at all. I don't think we're I very agree. different culturally at all. I think that we we live under different political regimes, and those different political systems have yielded different political outcomes, right? But I think like culturally, dispositionally, the same sorts of people exist. Maybe not in equal proportion, but certainly exist in both countries, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to sort of, um, you know, fantasize about the other country and, and sort of project your own hopes and aspirations and to fixate on little aspects of that country's politics or even like different states' politics. And, and so, yeah, like there's lots of gun owners in Canada. There's lots of uh, people that fetishize guns in Canada in the exact same way there's people that fetishize guns in the U.S. And those sorts of Canadians really fixate on, uh, you know, the American sort of Second Amendment regime, which, you know, yeah, it doesn't have an equivalent in Canada for various reasons. Again, because the political regime is different because there's no Second Amendment in Canada, right? Yeah. You know, if there was no Second Amendment in America, if there was a Second Amendment in Canada, you know, things would be very different. But it's not, you know, sometimes Canadians will give you this whole routine where, you know, these very sort of moralizing progressive Canadians where it's like, well, that's just not what we think in Canada, right? And it's like, give me a break, right? Like, it's just, you don't, progressive downtown Canadians, people from Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal or whatever, they will often project their own biases, their own kind of political dispositions as somehow being sort of like reflective of the entirety of the country. And I think that that is actually one of the big distinctions between Canadian and American culture to the extent it exists which is that progressive Canadians sort of see their progressive bubble as somehow being the most representative of like the true Canada. Whereas I think a lot of progressive Americans see their progressive bubble as being this like embattled, hated minority and are much more likely to view their own minority status as a, as a opportunity for like self-loathing and self-hatred and sort of say like, you know, the country is, it sucks. This is the only part of the country that has anything good going for it. And, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's something I find pretty upsetting about Americans, honestly. That they hate the country so much? Yeah, that there's just like this deep, like self-loathing that a lot of Americans have, especially American progressives. And it just seems to be being ratcheted up, 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 up and up. And I dislike the, the smug superiority that Canadian progressives have, you know, the self-righteousness and the moralizing and the anti-Americanism and, and the, the nationalism, basically. I consider myself pretty anti-nationalist and there's no one that you'll find that's more nationalistic than like a left-wing progressive Canadian. Okay. Uh, I had two things I was going to do for the intro to this. Yeah. Uh, to, one to make you feel at home. I was going to do a land acknowledgement, but I feel like that would be tasteless, so I didn't do that. <laughs> how, how common are those becoming in, in the U.S.? I have never heard one in my life in your in life. Here. Thank God. Oh my. Actually, I might have heard one in California. Is that so? Maybe. I don't remember. If I did, I pr tried my best to black it out of my mind. And any, hopes... of your, any of your like left-wing streamer buddies do it? I don't have left-wing streamer buddies. That's funny. <laughs> That's a funny joke. That was a good one. I am a Nazi online, essentially, so, so I have no left-wing friends. I mean, but you're, you're aware of these people, right? Surely some... Do they really do land acknowledgements on know. stream? I'm, I'm curious. Like, that seems the like... The data centers for this stream are actually located in <laughs> Delaware, which is the land of the... Yeah, that'd be pretty funny. Um, I did... A, I did... A, I had a Zoom meeting. Oh, yeah, because I was testifying at some Canadian thing for some legislation. And, yeah, the, even though it was Zoom and we were in all different parts of the country, they... The, the the chair of the meeting began with a land acknowledgement and then she had like a moment of reflection in which we were all just supposed to think about whose ancestral lands we were on and just took a moment to sort of think did you know yeah the coast salish territory oh, i've heard it so she many should times. have quizzed you guys afterwards <laughs> oh i guess you would know yeah okay yeah. um the second intro i had an idea where i was going to read down all of the cool facts i could find about you from okay. a wikipedia page oh god because i know how much you like that but you don't have one yet just a, a talk page, page with people fighting over it so i'm, I'm very i'm very pleased that i don't have one actually <laughs> Okay, well, we'll see after your <laughs> big time on the show, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the Before we jump into that, uh, you mentioned the people have a really hard time seeing shades of gray on anything, which I guess is like a very human thing, and people say that a lot, but it's very, very, very annoying when it comes politically, because uh, when I look at, for instance, the United States, and I'm sure it's similar for every country around the world, there are aspects of this country that I think we should be super proud of. Mm -hmm. I think the United States is a really cool place. Um, I'm sure Canada is a really cool place. Uh, most countries are probably... Pr a lot of countries are really cool places. 
it bothers me that it's so hard to find a side that is either willing to say like, hey, we've done a lot of cool things and we've done some pretty shady things too, but yeah. we're like trying our best. It's either, like you said, like the progressive side is basically like we are as of right now, still a white supremacist, uh, you know, discriminatory country that has so much work to do. And then the right is like, actually, well, you know, without slavery, they would still be in Africa. So I think that was an okay thing, you know? Yeah. It, like you have like the most polar opposites and recognizing shades of like rights and wrong just seems to be a completely impossible thing to do. Yes. There's, there's this, a quote that I once heard that I really liked, which is that the worst thing you've ever done is not the truest thing about you, right? And I think that a lot of times now, particularly progressive people have this attitude that if you can find the worst things, like you found the truest things, you found the defining truth, right? And I think that's the case with, uh, certainly with the way that a lot of American progressives sort of understand America's role in the world, particularly when it comes to like foreign policy and stuff. It's like you find evidence that America, you know, bombed Cambodia or did something, you know, legitimately quite terrible and awful. And then you're sort of saying like, okay, that's the essence of America right there. That is the- The, the, the mask slipping. Yeah, that, 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 that's like the true America, right? Like, and then thus there is no opportunity to be, uh, to be patriotic in any way because, you know, how can I possibly be patriotic when I'm, you know, a citizen of a country that bombed Cambodia and killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like, all, obviously the story is complex. There are ter terrible things in American history, but there's also so many heroic triumphs. There's so much that America has given to the world. There's so many people that want to come to this country every day, right? And there's, it's just, yeah, it just seems like such a sort of shallow, simple-minded sort of analysis. And I don't know why people are so afraid of it. Like, I don't know why people will not give themselves permission to see that nuance, to see that shade of gray, to sort of, and, and to explore these topics, honestly, like, I don't think there's anything wrong exploring like American war crimes. I don't think that that sort of should make you automatically feel like you have no opportunity to be patriotic after you've consumed uh, or engaged in that topic. But I also don't think there's anything wrong with sort of exploring great stories of American achievement and American innovation and the lives of great Americans who have contributed so much to this country and the world, right? Like so many people, they feel like their personal identity is threatened if they explore certain dangerous topics or topics that are sort of associated with the other side, you know? I feel like you could have a guy that has like a channel where he's showing off like all of these crazy, amazing, awesome cars and he talks a little bit about them or whatever. And then you, you go and he seems to be really knowledgeable. And you go to his house, you go to his garage and you find out that like every shot was like a zoom in and they're just hot wheels. Like he doesn't <laughs> actually know how to drive any of them. And he doesn't actually care about cars at all. He just, is kind of like a model guy. Yeah. Sometimes when I look at politics, I feel like there's an aesthetic about the political thing. And it seems like people are doing politics when in reality, like you said, it's just kind of like all it's, it's like social groups mm -hmm. or it's like I have these opinions because this is my circle and these are the things that we think. But if you try to push people on any of these particular things, you don't really have anything going on at all. I, do you know who Peter Boghossian is? No. Um, you might have seen him on YouTube. He's a guy where he'll ask people like, oh, what do you think about this thing? What level of conviction do you have? What would it take to change your mind? Mm -hmm. uh, these are three incredibly basic questions that as soon as you start asking people these things they immediately collapse yeah. but prior to any of this uh line of inquisition they'll have the strongest conviction in the world about how they treat other people right uh -huh. you can ask people um i'm reminded i'm doing a big no-no right now okay i'm quoting because i only read the things on twitter about this when the guy tweeted about this particular thing uh i think he did a study on this it was the um asking kids questions at college campuses about how they felt about israel palestine yeah. and it was how they felt about the saying from the river to the sea okay. and there was, there was like a 50 point swing and how you would feel about it once you knew what the river and the sea were uh. like even just having a little bit more information would dramatically change people's perceptions of things and I feel like for a lot of political issues, the, the battlegrounds are largely aesthetic. And I hate to use the word like post-truth because uh, I'm pretty sure people have been saying that for like 100 years. Yes. But I really just feel like we have completely abandoned any notion of truthful things. And the thing that irritates me the most about that is I think there is a lot of genuine debate and discussion that can happen from both sides, from a strong left yes. to a strong right around certain issues, especially things like COVID lockdowns and yes. vaccine mandates and stuff. There's a lot of really good conversations that can yeah. happen there. But instead, the conversations are in the United States, it's that Bill Gates wants to put 5G chips into us yes. from a Chinese bioweapon, uh, or like every conservative wants every person to die for no reason because they hate I guess poor people. Yes. And then in Canada, I guess it was um, Trudeau wants to use the banks to silence all political dissent mm. or, you know, Canadian truckers and far right people want to shut down the economy forever because they're mad about immigration. Yes. Yeah. B because these issues end up getting so segued off into these polar opposite areas where there's absolutely no overlap, the all the political discourse is trash. 
yeah. people ask me like what conversation you've had recently you're really proud of i'm like none of them they all <laughs> suck they're actually so horrible conversations between different people yes, yes i mean you do though have a lot of conversations with awful people don't you yeah like, and they're usually pretty f***ing horrible yeah so why do you do it so much um well that was my next question for you okay Fuck you. <laughs> no because i mean it's 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 true uh, you know i agree with everything that you said but i think that it's also the case that we can get a warp it's particularly people like you and i in these kind of like exalted sort of media positions right we can get a warped sense of where your average person's mindset is or how close-minded your average person is if so many of our conversations just occur with other political freaks, right? Like if we're having, like if your kind of sense of uh, where everybody else is, is just entails having conversations with people like, you know, Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson, I can see how that would leave you pretty discouraged after a while. But do you feel that this is the case with just like ordinary people that in your daily life, like just ordinary <laughs> Americans, do you think they're as polarized as their thought leader classes? I think they are getting there or I think they are there. Yeah. I think there's two things going on. So one thing you mentioned between you've got like talking to your audience and then yeah. you've got kind of like doing debater conversations. The reason why I really like debater conversations is because it forces you at some point to make your ideas commensurate with the yes. other guy. You have to, because you're having an actual conversation to each other. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to speak to each other. And that, I think that exercise is really important because it, to some extent, as long as it's happening more than once a year, it's humanizing the other person, right? Mm. Uh, like liberals will talk all the time about how we're so much better when it comes to like racial tolerance and stuff. It's not because liberals are better people, it's because they tend to live in cities where there's a lot more of those types of people around. You can't hate people yes. that you grow up around and you see every day, it's not possible. And I think that for a lot of stuff in the political aisle right now, uh, on, on the left and right, the caricatures of both sides are allowed to grow when you never actually talk to or have any conversations with the other side because yeah because like conservatives are just these evil hateful people that want to destroy gay rights and lgbt yeah. stuff and hate women and the left are these horrible self-hating white people that just want minorities to cuck all the white men and for jews to run society or whatever i don't yeah. know what people believe yeah but the, the lack of communication is really bad um and then the one thing uh you can say something on that and then also on the second thing when you talk about like i said the average person like this okay here's my thesis okay. all right so you got a thesis all right i have this feeling that Everybody identifies with social groups, and with these social groups, you inherit a bunch of moral and political positions. Yes. However, I think I think that's okay because it's probably like that's a human thing. Everybody has some ideological conformity with groups that they're around. It's probably natural and okay. But I think the problem is these groups have gotten like national or international. Mm. So in the past, maybe um, you know, maybe you live in Edmonton or maybe you live in Omaha, and you've got your conservatives, and they believe this thing, and you're pretty like ideologically conformed with each other, but you're different from a lot of the other conservatives around the country, right? Yeah. Conservatives in Central California are gonna be different than conservatives in Missouri. Um, conservatives in Alberta might be different than conservatives in uh, you know, Toronto or Vancouver. Yeah. But the groups now, because of the internet, have grown such that the bubble, the ideological conformity has to be set across entire countries mm. now. And I think that's really bad. And I think that is where some of the polarization is coming from, where now Leah Thomas isn't just a divisive issue in, I don't even know what state she was from, was it Florida? She's not a divisive issue in Florida sports or her school. That's mm. a divisive issue for the entire country. Yes, if not even the, the entire, world. entire world. <laughs> yeah. right? Like, I mean, it's amazing like how often you'll watch YouTubers, like just forget Canada, like you'll watch British YouTubers or YouTubers in Europe and they'll be like citing something that happened in some state in America and then kind of extrapolating wildly about how this reflects the problem with the West, you know? It's these kind of imagined communities. I think you're right. Like they have gotten really gigantic. But I, I do think though that even then, we're still talking about, I think, the minority of people that spend a lot of time consuming this type of content, right? Like I just think that your average person is just much less sort of plugged in and derives much less of their personal identity from politics than the sort of people that you or I are likely to encounter. I think that's that's it's got to be true definitionally because in yeah. this world the people are the most like plugged in and everything. Yeah. But I think that social media has given people ways to connect to a lot of these issues in ways that they wouldn't have traditionally. So like the old grandma that might just be like doing yarn and watching yeah. you know whatever late night TV. Well now she's sending you Facebook memes from mm -hmm. you know Bill Gates wants to eat children dot com yeah. or whatever and she's like <laughs> completely plugged into that ecosystem now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> it's it's true and I, I mean like I, I i can see that being true i mean definitely i think this is actually one of the things that they say about trump specifically right is because since he is this kind of pre-existing celebrity brand that a lot of people knew of before uh his run for president 
that he is sort of like given people an in. And I think you could also say that, you know, just the kind of like the dopier nature of a lot of political commentary these days is a much less high bar than it used to be to enter and participate and start self-identifying sort of politically. You know, earlier I was talking about the the conversation with William F. Buckley and, and Governor Wallace, right? And that was like on firing line, you know, which is a very like highfalutin, highbrow kind of show that they used to have where they would be talking about philosophy and like, you know, quoting Aristotle and this kind of thing. And like, that's what like political commentary used to be or like newspaper columns and, you know, round tables on, on cable news and this kind of stuff. But now it's just, you know, no offense, like just any guy with like a microphone and like a, a Twitch account or whatever, like this is now what political commentary is. It's just any guy on, on Facebook, any guy on Twitter, right? Like in some ways, like, and this is actually something I've been thinking about a bit because I've often thought of myself as being somewhat kind of populist in, in disposition, as I think a lot of sort of people are when they're young. It's like, oh, elites, they're suck. They're, you know, preventing, you know, democracy and this kind of thing. But now in many ways, we are living in a very populist age. We're living in a very democratic age. You know, the barriers to participate in po political conversations at what used to be the elite level, which is to be like a commentator, like to be a political commentator, the barriers to entry into that position have never been lower than they are now. And you do kind of have to think like it makes me a little bit, I think, nostalgic for a more elitist media climate when the sort of people doing the political commentary were people like William F. Buckley, as opposed to someone like Candace Owens, who doesn't know anything about anything. Right. Yeah. The um, I don't know where you stand on this, but it reminds me of like people ask me like, yeah, alternative media might have problems, but like, would you prefer the mainstream media to alternative media? And every time I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not even close. <laughs> it's not even close. Who are the all, who are the bastions of alternative media? This is the thing. Yeah. Like, this is the thing. I've actually been thinking about making a video on this because it's like, you know, I read the New York Times. I read the New Yorker. You know, I read a lot of these sort of like prestige American publications and they're just like the best in the world. Like they're just so well written. They're so well researched. Like they have like great reporters who are doing good work. You know, I used to work at the Washington Post for six years. I was consistently impressed by like my colleagues there. It's like they're doing really good work. These people are professionals. They understand what they're doing. They're great writers. They and then you compare that to like the dreck that's coming out from these people with their microphones and just yapping. And the other thing too, is like, you can look at like your buddy Alex Jones, right? And it's like, even then, even like a guy like as conspiracy brained as him, who is he quoting? He inevitably winds up quoting the mainstream media. He's not quoting, you know, like Daily Wire or whatever, because they don't, they're not actually doing any reporting. Every, you look at any alternative media source, you know, whether it's on the right or the left, you know, you just do a few clicks and you find that they're always just relying on someone else's reporting at the end of the day. They'll cherry pick and, you know, massage the facts to be what they want, but they're not doing anything substantial. And the writing, the writing sucks. I wish that people had a clear, I wish that there were clear delineations between what was what, because a lot of people don't actually understand, like what you just said, doing reporting. Yeah. For a lot of people, um, reporters, uh, news anchors, media pundits yes. and like just online commentary guys all of these people are the same yes. yes and i'm talking to other adults and it's very frustrating sometimes where um i had a debate recently over stuff related of course to israel palestine and i would link a thing and the guy would be like oh i don't trust that source it's twitter yeah and i'm like twitter is not a source you will look who's tweeting and look at the particular yes. account and yes. then go yes. or he'll be like here's a report um this is like incredibly reputable this comes from uh msnbc or the new york times and I'm like, my issue is that like the sources for all of this are the Gaza and Health Ministry, and I think there are problems here, or the IDF, and there are problems here. I'm like, no, 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 no. The source isn't the Gaza and Health Ministry. The source here is is NBC. Mm. It's like, do you know what you're saying when you say that? Yeah. When you say like, yeah. And people's inability to parse and figure out like, am I reading an op-ed? I I think that in the U.S. maybe you have higher opinions of people. I think that uh, I think it should be illegal for reporting like news stations to have opinion anything because people are too stupid to tell the difference <laughs> people will say things like and i'll say this to people because people are like oh well what's a good news publication to read the reality is if you read any of them like the reporting you'll be more informed than 99 percent of people yes. but and then people are like, what about fox news it's like fox news reporting is generally pretty accurate it's, mm. which is about as accurate as anything else and they'll be like really well what about when tucker carlson said this tucker carlson's not a fucking reporter yes. what the fuck are you talking yes. about what about yes. when bill o'reilly he's a pundit there's a talk show mm. and people people can't tell the difference oh yeah People, people, you know, another pet peeve of mine is that, you know, I agree, like some of the Fox hard news reporting is good, but that's in part uh, because a lot of it is also wire services, right? Sure. And people, Reuters, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, but Fox also does some good reporting on their own as well. I, I won't 
you know, it's that side of Fox. But I think that people's, but like, but I'm, the fundamental thing I'm getting at is just like literacy, cultural literacy, media literacy, like all of these things are just so low right now. And this is like something that I care a lot about with my channel, like just getting people up to speed on just very basic things, especially young people, right? It shouldn't be as hard as it is. And it makes me wonder a lot about the education system and just the degree that people are happy with their you know, their ignorance, right? Like their ignorance is more satisfying to them. Like they know what they know. They've come up with a sort of like narrative of how the world works. And that's their truth, right? Like that's what they're invested in. And they don't have an interest in sort of filling the gaps in their own brains, right? Like they don't have an interest in sort of, I, sh I think that a, a very healthy, important disposition that we should all go through life with is like, think about what I don't know. What do I not know? What do I not understand about this world? And what can I do to correct that ignorance. And so many people just don't have that disposition, or if they do, they just want to go for like the, the shortcut to knowledge, right? And I think that's why conspiracy theories are so attractive, is conspiracy theories like the anti-mainstream media, you know, the mainstream media does nothing but like write lies, right? Like these are like shortcuts to knowledge. It's like, I like if you're a guy who like never reads the New York Times, like very ignorant about a lot of things, and you, you, you feel insecure, it's like, okay, I don't know a lot about the world, I don't know a lot about what's going on, uh, what if all of the mainstream media is actually run by evil liars? Ah, that's good. That then justifies my own ignorance, right? And it, it, it sort of uh, enables me to have a media diet that then just consists of consuming this high dopaminergic stuff where people are yelling and screaming and, you know, saying the most outrageous over the top rhetoric, which is more fun. Like that's the junk food, right? Like people mm -hmm. don't want to eat their, their vegetables. Um, the, I got an email once from a guy. I'm going to ask you uh, where, yeah. the, where, where you think that disposition comes from. I got an email once from a guy that was super interested in me. And he said uh, he has a theory for why uh, politics has gotten so crazy. Uh, and he calls it, I think he called it the magic box theory. Okay. And he said that something that's happened as time has gone on, the, um, the, the sophistication and the complexity of all of the electronic devices we use has gotten to unbelievable levels, such that in the past, uh, if you had like an abacus, you know exactly how it works. There is no place for a conspiracy theory in an abacus. Mm. You just, you move the beats over. There's very little in a calculator to have a conspiracy theory, yes. very little for a TI-83. But as these devices become more and more sophisticated and we become more and more removed from the actual processes themselves, and we're just like pushing buttons, all of society is kind of tended in this direction and our lack of grounding and the understanding of how anything around us works makes it easier for people to start making crazy assumptions about like the things around us because everything is kind of like run by magic and you can't really make you don't really know anything and you can insert so many strong statements one popular one uh, I always get scared when I give an example. I'm accidentally going to say something you completely disagree with, but it hasn't yeah. happened yet. A really popular one. I'm sorry to trigger everybody out there, okay? Maybe this has changed and I haven't seen any new research, but a really popular one is that your phone is always listening to you oh, yes. and that ads are being inserted based on things you yes, said. Yes, yes. So many different tech companies have tried to do like research or like experiments or studies to see yes. like if this has happened or whatever. Never. Yeah. Not a single time has this ever been verified or validated, but yes. everybody believes it. Yes. But a lot of it is because like, well, fuck, I don't know how the fuck my phone works. How does Siri know when I say, hello, Siri? Mm -hmm. It must be listening to me all the time. And why is it a big stretch to assume that it would be recording every single thing too like maybe or people don't even know like the sophistication of technology somebody will say like oh okay well if um if the government could put a key logger on my computer and then get the email to my password why wouldn't they be able to just unencrypt an entire iphone drive yeah. not knowing that like the difference between these two technologies is like so far apart yes. to unencrypt like that like stuff that it would take the heat death of the universe to actually get through yeah. um and, and i think yeah, i think a lot of it is because stuff has become less understandable because we just don't know yeah and i mean i like that makes sense i mean i also think though that that can be a bit of an excuse right like i don't think this stuff is that hard to get the basics on if you care right i think the problem is that people just don't care it's what i said before it's like you know people people are ignorant and they solve the ignorance with you know sort of ludicrous theories that make a kind of intuitive sense but they're not interested in objectively uh you know, measuring whether or not that's true or false, right? Yeah, but I think the difference is, is that in the past, there were no, there were no shortcuts. You had to learn. If yeah. you wanted to, if you wanted to drive a car, you had yeah. to learn how to change the gears. Yeah. Now you don't have to. Yeah. So I think people will take the shortcuts if they're there. Yeah. And today, like UX UI design is all about like how do we make this as yeah. easy as possible to follow. Whereas before, right, they would say it, uh, computers used to be a smart person in front of a dumb terminal. Now yeah. it's a dumb person in front of a smart terminal mm. because stuff has been so ease of accessed. Um, or maybe you don't agree with that. You, you talked about earlier, like this disposition of people to kind of like uh, chase like whatever is easy or to get the quick and easy answer without yeah. doing the work. Where do you think that disposition comes from? 
Um, I think some of it comes from a sort of insecurity. I think that some of it comes from, I mean, I think now we live in this very sort of populist culture where there is no threat of pushback, no matter how sort of dopey your argument is, as long as you can sort of dress it up in some veneer of being anti-authority, anti-elite, you know, anti-establishment in some way. So like if you say the thing like, well, I think the phones are spying on me, like who in your social circle these days is going to push back against it? People are going to nod and be like, oh, yeah, those corporations could totally see them doing that. You know, it's just like you can posit any kind of like crazy statement about the CIA or, you know, whatever, like at the FBI, the deep state. Right. It doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left, the, me the mainstream press, whatever. Like you can put if any sort of like large established institution of authority if you posit some theory of the case that involves them doing sinister bad things i feel like in today's political culture in today's culture more broadly like you won't get any pushback against that and so i think that we live in a culture that kind of encourages that style of thinking and a culture that does not encourage people going like um actually i don't think that's very plausible or um actually like look at this and learn about this and figure out what the actual truth of the case is everybody wants to be a populist everybody wants to be against the man you know and taking the side of the man unpopular but in some ways i think it's what's needed you know people need to make the case for 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 and i, I feel like I've, I've i haven't seen i'm sorry stephen i haven't consumed a great deal of your media but i feel like i have seen you in one debate like you're making the case basically for the established authorities, like particularly when I think it was in some conversation you were having with somebody about COVID and that and okay. it's like at some point you have to be willing to trust the CDC or, or you have to be willing to defer that these people are not in the positions that they are because they're evil people who want to like control. They're in these positions because they're experts and they've been rewarded for their expertise and that their passion in life is to use their expertise on behalf of the common good right mm -hmm. but a lot of people like you don't get very far arguing that kind of case these days because a lot of people if you just say well i think they're just evil or i think they're just doing it for their own good or they're lining their pockets or whatever mm -hmm. like who is going to push back against that and look like a you know a a, a cuck for the uh, for the man yeah or i wish people would at least understand like the strength of the claim they're making and how absolutely bizarre it would be if this were to be the case that like uh, so when it comes to identifying conspiracies, for instance, like so if, if somebody were to say um, there is a conspiracy at the FBI where the top two or three leaders were gathering information that they didn't have warrants for and storing it in a database so they could look stuff up very quickly. That would be in my mind. There's not very many people involved. I can see a clear utility. That seems pretty believable. Like mm -hmm. I, I would believe that. But when people start saying like. The conspiracies are, are, are all of the intelligence agencies worked together, for instance, for January 6th to set all of that up to turn yeah. Americans against each other to cause violence. And then they were going to show up and save the day at the end and then blame Trump on it or whatever. I'm like, how many people are involved in this? Thousands. And this was actually setting like American on American, like fighting each other. And there's been no leaks, the amount of coordination, the different styles of leadership, all the different political people, like the claim you're making, it's possible, but we're at like 0. 0.000. <laughs> That's an extraordinary claim, yes. right? Um, and yeah, people don't understand sometimes when they make a claim, like if you were to tell me like a pharmaceutical company um, cheated on the edge of like a study to get like a particular medication passed the FDA, it's like, okay. I, I mean, I could believe it. There's a whole bunch of money to be made. There's a lot of people that could gain and maybe, you know, they're cheating the edge because like, yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter that much. But when you're saying things like they're intentionally manufacturing a vaccine that they know is horrible, that's going to poison everybody and the yes. FDA is complicit because it's like, bro, government jobs don't pay that much. <laughs> okay. If you wanted to people over and everything you're not gonna go work for the fucking government nine times out of ten you're gonna work in private industry or something else you're like it's just yeah the 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 claims are unhinged and then what's most scary is that like you're looking at your fellow countrymen like that yeah and most people how many people does the the government and, and like these private industries employ it's like millions of people in the united states all of these people most of them are ordinary folks they live see, next to you like this this is the problem right like this uh, before i was talking about like sort of the degree that anti-americanism has sort of is prominent on sort of the progressive American left, right? But I do think that like now this super ultra populist MAGA uh, right wing kind of thing is becoming very anti-American in its own way too, be precisely because it's positing a theory that says that basically all American institutions are run by evil people, right? Like everything in the government, everything in Hollywood, even, you know, sports now, like it's all run by like the evil cabal, the regime, right? Like everyone is like, Everyone in any position of authority in America is basically trying to screw the common American man. And, and it's international. It's not just international. It's internationally. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Well, because it's the lizard people. Stephen, I get, or, right? so, or the Jews or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I, yeah, I did that with Peterson where I'm like, for the vaccines, like, let's say that let's say that I buy into all of this. The schools, yeah. the private firms um, and the government are all rigged against it. Is this happening all over the world? What about even with our enemies? Even Russia yeah. and China aren't calling out like the whole like. 
yeah. No, it's like it's, it's somehow, you know, it's like, you know, you have socialist governments in Europe, you have like Netanyahu in Israel. Have you know, all you, come together to agree on, just, the, yeah. on these particular sets yeah, of conspiracies. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing you brought up before, uh, I, I can never tell everything I complain about. I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, uh, like music today is destroying the youth. Yes. And it's like people have always complained about it. Yes. So it, it, it does feel like it's always gotten worse, I guess. <laughs> one thing you brought up before was um, if you, I feel like if somebody, gives me an opinion i feel like i can guess like 20 more opinions they have okay. just because of the insane yeah. conformity around such a broad like every issue is hyper fucking politicized these days like if i hear somebody in the united states i don't know if it's gotten a candidate if i hear somebody in the united states say equity or equitable yes. instead of equally uh -huh. i can already guess <laughs> i already know 25 things about you yes, you think yes. that white supremacy is a huge issue in the united states you probably don't even really support biden and you think the voting rights less are two evils yes. you're probably massively in favor of like the vaccines and like lockdowns and mandates you you, uh, pro you probably are in favor of like DEI, affirmative action. You probably think that like BIPOC is a good acronym to describe yes. people. Like there's like so many things. And then on the other side too, if somebody says like, oh yeah, I think that the system is rigged against Andrew Tate. Oh, yeah. you probably also support Russia and the war. Yes, you probably yes. are a huge Trump. Yeah. I feel like every single issue has become so politicized that all of these topics are now battlegrounds mm. for the... And I say political debate, but it's really for the lowest common denominator of like aesthetic political debate. Yeah. And and one of the byproducts of that is what you said earlier, that we can't be proud of anything anymore. Something that really uh, makes me sad. There was a guy running for the Democratic uh, presidency, I think it was like eight years ago, uh, Cory Booker. Oh, yeah. And he said something on stage, uh, I, I don't, whatever for him as a candidate, but he said something on stage. He's like, I don't know why the Democrats have this reputation of demonizing success. We should celebrate wealth. And I'm like, yeah, what the f That's true. There is not a single thing that we can take like accomplishment for of anything in the US anymore. And yeah. I think one of the saddest things, because it happened under Trump and I give Trump credit for it, is um, I'm dancing into the vaccine topic. Don't know how you feel about that. Regardless of mandates or not, I yeah. feel like the mRNA vaccines, that was an amazing achievement of yes. capitalism, of globalism, of US leadership, of yes. a president doing warp speed. But the left isn't gonna really give him credit for that. Yeah. The right sure as f isn't giving anybody credit for anything for vaccines. <laughs> yeah. And now for the things that we do do that's like really cool or really good, there's not even place to have like, I guess pride in that anymore because yeah. all of it is yeah all of it like every institution in America has been demonized by either the left or the right right like nothing the government has never done anything good in the mind in the eyes of the right and private sector has never done anything good in the eyes of the left right so you're like where where do Americans go to derive their pride these days that's an open question right like there's so much of again like there's so much of American culture that I love that I you know and I make a lot of videos kind of sentimentalizing different aspects of American culture and celebrating it in part because I think that uh, it's it becomes a national security issue at some point, right? Like if Americans like I, this is a bit of a sort of trite cliche, you know, uh, people have said some version of this quote that, you know, like a strong power like America is not going to be destroyed by an external enemy. It's only going to be destroyed by an internal enemy, right? And if you have a broad culture in America on both the, the left and the right, and if the far extremes of both sides are kind of like squeezing the center out, then, you know, that does start to get to a point where you start to wonder, like, what is the long term future of this country if it's just full of people who will not take credit for the things that they've achieved and just are engaged in this arms race to see who can hate the country more, who can tear down the institutions more, who can fantasize about electing more sort of American hating people to higher and higher office where their only mandate is to basically destroy the uh, the system, right? Yeah, it's which terrifying. is so frustrating because I feel like there's so much talent. The systems in place here are really effective because obviously they're still working despite all the other yes. problems. Um, and then the people and the talent internationally and domestically are so high. It feels like when America aims itself at something, it can accomplish a lot in a very quick amount of time. I remember in the beginning of like the COVID scare stuff, there was like, there were no, there was no PPE, the ventilators were f***ed, like everything was f***ed. And then we finally like got our shit together. Yes. And in the course of like three to six months, like all of that yes. was 100% taken care of. Yes. And I was like, like if we could just have like more unity around certain issues like earlier, it maybe right. would be a little better, but. It's funny because I remember actually writing a lot about this kind of stuff during COVID because I remember like in the, in the early days, uh, there was so much sort of this tendentious sort of uh, stuff being written in Canada. We were like, oh, America's fucked it up again. Like America can't do anything right. Oh, ho, ho, Canada, you know, super. And I remember like trying to take like a long term view of it. I was like, yeah, America often sort of stumbles out of the gate because mm -hmm. America's this big, messy, complicated country. And it's difficult to kind of like. But I knew that like ultimately the vaccines would be developed in America. I knew that ultimately the rollout would be successful in the US. Like I knew that this kind of stuff was coming. But there was just so much in Canada. There was so much righteous posturing about America can't get anything right. 
And then there was so much righteous posturing from the anti-American left as well that like, you know, again, like it's it's what I said before, like that the truest things are somehow the worst things, right? And that the positive things are somehow unrepresentative or we're just going to kind of block them and not think about them because they kind of complicate our our tidy little narrative. But no, it's I, I think I agree with you. Like, I think that the, the, the vaccine rollout Operation Warp Speed, like that is the best of America. Like that is very consistent with a long track record of America achieving uh, tremendous things when the pressure is on. Right. But yeah, who's going to who, who where where is the constituency for that? Do you think you need an external enemy to keep your society focused? No, I don't think so at all. I think that I actually I'm sure you've seen tweets of this extent. You know, Ronald Reagan used to have this quote that he was mocked for where he said, like, you know, imagine if there was like an alien invasion. Wouldn't that bring mankind together? You know, he was thinking like the communists and the capitalists, we'd all join hands to fight a common external enemy and we'd realize how small our petty squabbles are. But I, I remember seeing like a tweet where they said, like, you know, if aliens invaded today, like, you know, a third of America would deny it's it. happening. A third would sympathize with the aliens. And then you'd have like some faction that would be like, maybe we should fight these aliens. And then the other two factions would say, like, you're cucks and establishment shills and all that. So no, it's 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 pretty tragic, right? And because a lot of people, you know, the sort of the David Brooks set. I remember he wrote a column that he told. He said that he sort of regretted in retrospect. Where pre-COVID, he said something like, "Imagine if America had to face like you know a big pandemic. That would bring us all together, and we'd realize how small our squabbles were." But the the pandemic was the test case. It did not. Americans did not rally behind. I mean an external foe or whatever you want to call it. Like it's the closest thing to an external foe. To be fair. No, it's not. What do you mean? No, I mean, like, I, I feel like I feel like the virus. I understand what you're saying and that it's like a problem we all have to come together for. Yeah. But I feel like uh, it's it's intangible enough that because it's like a virus and a disease that like it's not something that is, is quite as like present as I do agree with you that if aliens were to come, I don't know what that <laughs> would look like. Um, I do think it's really. In have you seen Independence Day? Yeah. You read Ender's Game? No. Oh. They're two like very different takes on what happens when aliens are present. Oh. Uh, Independence Day is like the whole world comes yeah. together. Independence Day is that like everybody kind of comes together, but like everybody is plotting for the entirety of the war for what's going to happen right after this enemy is defeated because everybody's going to go back to hating each other. So oh. it's like trying to posture oh, on that. That's pretty good. That's um, a good take. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, why do you do content on YouTube? Why do you do anything? Do, you talk about anything? this. It sounds pretty depressing. It sounds pretty doomer. Well, I, I, yeah. I like, why do you? Yeah. What's your What's your goal? I mean, I, I like to think that I am doing my small part, right? Like I'm. I have a lot of things that I like to complain about, but I like to think and this is another sort of line that somebody once told me where it's like, you know, you have to think about like, are you making content that's just about problem identifying or problem solving? And I feel like right now the economic incentives, or at least people assume the economic incentives are all in the direction of problem identifying and not problem solving. And in my own small way, I like to think that I'm trying to solve some of these problems. You know, I make I make content, a lot of which is about sort of celebrating American culture, like celebrating because I, I do think Canadians are part of American culture. So when I say American culture, I'm not positing just the culture that exists in the United States. I'm positing the culture that exists on this continent that I think Canadians are equal part in. And I do think it's important that we that, you know, that we find things to be proud of on on in our culture, that we sort of celebrate it and that we become culturally literate as well, that we understand truthfully what our history has entailed, all of the many achievements that we've achieved, you know, the, the great inventions and the way that our quality of life has advanced so dramatically, even since the end of World War Two. You know, I would sort of say since 1870 ish, you know, the quality of life has advanced so much greater than any society that has ever existed in the history of man. And these are things that are worth being proud of and worth like finding sort of sincere appreciation for. And, you know, I, I make videos that try to communicate some basic sort of political fluency about the Canadian political system, the Canadian political climate. My main audience is not even Canadians based on my own uh, internal numbers. It's Americans who want to learn more about Canada. And I think that that matters a lot, too, because, you know, I'm somebody that believes in like Canada, U.S. integration. Like, I think that's going to be tremendously in the interests of both of our countries to get closer and closer and, you know, have some sort of common, you know, thing in the same way that the Europeans do, where you can come and go freely and work and all this kind of stuff. And I think that part of the way that you achieve that is by making Americans more familiar with Canada, demystifying Canada in the same way. So it's kind of a very mystical place right now, no, besides I'm, Quebec? Or? No, no, no. I mean, like, you know, Americans can, as we said at the beginning, right, like with the healthcare system and stuff, like, Americans are often told about Canada just as a kind of metaphor for their own politics, right? Like you learn isolated facts about Canada to the extent that they help one side or another in their domestic uh, arguments, mm -hmm. not in the sense that... Uh, That's really true. That's how Americans approach all... Like if somebody brings up Rome, 
yeah. in an American political conversation, the next thing out of their mouth is going to be how immigration is going to destroy the United States yes. because multiculturalism is what destroyed Rome. Or if yes. somebody brings up, they'll just say Europe or Canada. Yeah. It's going to be some stupid statement about how actually socialism is really good and it yeah. fixes every problem yeah. and all their... Yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, no. yeah. There's, there's something worth just kind of like learning about these places as what they are. And they're imperfect and flawed and complicated places as well. But, you know, there's some value in, in learning about them because, you know, uh, like... Canada has a lot to teach America in the same way that America has a lot to teach Canada. We're the two most similar countries in the world. We have, as I said before, like basically the same culture. We have the same kinds of people. Our basic disposition towards problem solving and looking at issues is the same. So I think that, you know, if something works in one part of America, it probably works in Canada and, and vice versa. Have you ever been a debater archetype? Do you like argue with people politically in your real life or did you ever or? Uh, I used to be a, a TV pundit guy, like one of these uh, talking heads on the on the television. And I guess uh, I worked actually for a very conservative network, a sort of Fox News North, they sometimes called it Sun News. And I would do some sort of debates on that. I worked for another show actually as well, where I did uh, I was like a panel. So like, you know, there's three main political parties in Canada, the Conservatives, Liberal and NDP. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wasn't affiliated with the party, but like I was the guy that like sort of had the dispositionally sort of conservative perspective. And so there was some debates on that. But as I I've noticed gotten, you say three, excuse me, what about the, uh, I had some far right Canadian friends. What was oh, that the, stupid the, thing? The People's Party that does, has never elected a single member of parliament. In Is it, was it called the People's Party? The this was the one the that after the vaccines. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was the one that was going to take over. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, going to yeah. be a huge yeah, sweep. No, I, I think Dave Rubin interviewed the head of the <laughs> PPC and like the title was the next prime minister of Canada and oh, won like God. four, four percent of the vote in zero seats. Mm -hmm. No, it's the internet is not real life, but, uh, but, but no, it's like, as I've gotten older, I've realized that, that debate seems pointless. And actually, this is something that I was going to ask you about, right? Whereas you were sort of defending your debates and that you, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that like one of the values is that it allows you to kind of like understand and humanize the other side. And I would just be curious to know if, if like, A, you feel that you've been humanized through these encounters, and if you feel that your opponents have been humanized in your own mind. I think that when you, I think that when you do anything, I think you have to acknowledge the realities of things that will happen as a byproduct of either physics or human nature. So when I talk about like uh, capitalism, or if I talk about um, policies that we would get to help people, uh, anytime you talk about putting like price caps or price floors or government intervention, you have to be aware that these are going to impact the market somehow. You can't pretend they don't exist. You can't turn a blind eye yeah. to it. There's markets are real and they are powerful. And whatever you intervene in them, whatever you intervene in them, something is going to happen as a byproduct of that. Um, when I think of somebody saying like, have I been humanized or do I humanize people? Uh, I don't know if that's a conscious or cognitive process where it's like, oh, like I do try to be, I do consciously try to be somewhat empathetic. It depends on the debate, it depends on what I'm talking to, it depends yeah. on what I'm trying to represent in a particular thing. I do try to be empathetic and humanize the people that I talk to to some extent. And I don't know if I get that same feel back from a lot of people that I talk to, but I think that the humanization is a byproduct of just having the conversations, um, especially because I'm pretty good at what I do, that when I do go on these shows, Whatever they see of me and however that person treats me, mm -hmm. it's going to be way better than the 30 second clip they saw of me prior to that. So even if the other person is a huge asshole, even if the mm -hmm. other person is like screaming at me or shouting at me, me being able to fully represent what I believe and what I think and that longer form thing is going to be infinitely better than the TikTok clips or the Twitter clips that gripers yeah. or far left <laughs> people or whatever are shooting out for me um, otherwise. So I do think it has helped. It's hard. Because um, I, I have to, I go to sleep every night playing this a million times on my fucking AirPods. It's that, um, it's the quote from Mr. Rogers. Yeah. The, uh, that like anytime there's a disaster oh, yeah, and yeah. everything seems, yeah, look for the helpers. Yes. That anytime you do a big debate, it's the huge shit shows on both sides. But what I'm really like trying to hone in on is like, am I getting a few emails from people saying like, hey, I used to think you were a huge cock loser and I think you're still kind of that, but you're like a little cooler or I appreciate you representing this. Those are the people that I try to look for. Mm. And I feel like the more I talk to other people, kind of like the more chance of that happening is. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess I could see it. Do you think here here's a Here's a question. Do you think it's important that I'm sort of asking you a question on your show? But You're fine. Do you, ask whatever. do you think it's important that, that presidential candidates debate? Um, when you say the word important, what do you mean by that? Well, do you think it serves the same function as what you're describing in your debates? Absolutely not. Mm. Political debates are like, um, you ask me a question about a thing, like, what do you think about homelessness? And then I'm talking at the audience about yes. the things that I believe that I know that they want to hear that I think will galvanize the most supporters. 
and that's it. We're not we're not actually yeah. really there is no actual conversation between like two political people, but that's like the game of politics, unfortunately, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Why and that doesn't happen in so like I guess that's true. Like when when you're debating one of these characters, you feel like you're actually both mutually invested in each other and like having a debate on the intellectual merits of the arguments that are being made. It's not playing to the, the crowd in the same Was that to me? No. <laughs> Absolutely. What? I wish that was the case. What? I wish that was the case. But isn't that what you just said? That's the, well, no. I said that no. I get humanized as a result yeah. of having the conversation. Yeah. But two people engaging, that what you just described happens one out of 10,000 debates yeah. where both sides are intellectually curious and they're truly trying to see and understand the other person so that you can have no, a really good back and forth. Not necessarily curious, but mm -hmm. just in the sense that they're at the very least engaged. Because when you're contrasting that to a political debate, oh, sure. you're saying that they're not even really engaged in their opponent. Yeah. They're, they're more engaged than then they would be either doing a TikTok clip or just like having a political debate where they're both talking to the yeah. audience. Yeah, they're more engaged, yeah. Are you thinking of it, your audience or their audience when you're in the heat of a debate? Um, it just, it super depends on on where I'm going and what the topic is. I, yeah. I don't think I could ever generalize that. So for instance, for Jordan Peterson, yeah. um, I'm not going to convince him or his audience that like institutions are really good yes. and we should trust all of them, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I'm not going to convince him. My goal would be to just like, let's just like ask a few questions just to get like a reality check on what exactly you're talking about and to get you to at least like own a few hard positions yeah. rather than just kind of like talking around them for a little bit. Mm. Uh, Jordan Peterson is very, very, very good at this where he, um, Ben Shapiro has rightly identified this as jacking off, just asking questions. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, although Ben Shapiro said does this so much. But yeah, we would say like, oh, well, why are there 20% excess deaths in Europe right after the vaccines came out? And there's no other explanation for it. And then you'll ask him, like, do you think vaccines killed like all these people? And like, well, I didn't say that. Yeah. OK. Um, and then, yeah, just like asking questions like, well, don't you think that if this was a thing that was happening, don't you think that like these people would say something or these people would ask questions or like if we think that it's like capitalist evil enterprises that made the mRNA vaccines, why didn't Johnson and Johnson, who couldn't make one, why didn't they call out these other companies to destroy them? Like, mm. wouldn't that make sense? The goal is to just like, because I'm never moving a person, right? And I'm sure you've had this experience. Sometimes you talk to people very far over here, very far over here. Yeah. You're never bringing them all the way over. You're just like asking a few questions to yeah. like make them flesh out their position a bit more in the hopes that in doing that, it'll move them a little bit. Yeah. I just always like the thing is that I always worry about is that and I think this goes back to what we we're saying before about like the degree that people live in bubbles and and you know very polarized and all that. I just I sometimes worry that like you know you can have a conversation with a person, you can make some degree of progress, you can make them maybe a little bit self-conscious about the weakness of their arguments and stuff in that moment. But then what I worry about is that like the second the debate ends and they go back into their bubble, they just regress. And they go completely, they, they learn nothing. Like their minds just revert to how it was beforehand. And then suddenly they go, oh, wasn't it awesome how you own destiny in that debate? And hey, he was such an idiot and blah, 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 and that kind of thing. And I, and, I, and I worry as well that the audience is similar, right? Like the audience might be listening to the debate and they're thinking like, oh, maybe this guy has a few points and so on and so forth. But then when they immediately, then they turn to the comments and the comments are like, oh, owned and sucked and what an idiot. And I can't blah, 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 blah. So I don't know, like, again, the space in which people are even allowed to reach these kind of moderate conclusions seems so preciously small. And also there's no one, there's no like super pundit class that exists to analyze these debates in a fair and objective way and say like, well, some had some good points and some had some good points, right? The reception of your debates, I assume, would always be sort of filtered through the various other partisan media always, know, filters yeah. that exist. I had a huge Israel-Palestine one with, um with uh, some people and uh, listening to people comment about that one and comment about the performance. I've seen so many shows now where people talk about how I got trashed, or yeah, I got yeah, trashed yeah. but not a single one, because I'll sit there and watch on stream. Let's see if they bring up a single actual substantive point from the conversation and not even one ever. Mm. And I'm like, well, what was the point of this? Somebody watched a 20 minute review on the debate. I mean, they're probably never going to watch the debate and nothing from that debate yeah. was even brought up. Yeah. And then people are going to carry forward this like simulacrum of the debate where yes. it's like, oh yeah, that conversation where Destiny got destroyed. And it's like, which conversation? Well, the one that uh, Brianna Joy Gray mentioned. Yeah. yeah. What, like why, how did they get destroyed? Well, she said it and I think it happened. And like, yeah, this it's, it's it is frustrating. Um, I do agree with you that people will go back immediately after, but uh, there's that saying that success is just, it's like luck meets or opportunity meets preparation. Mm. I think that when you're giving people these like critical questions to kind of make them question, you know, what's going on on their side, you're just kind of like slowly massaging 
and creating space so that in the future, if something happens, if you have heard these things, maybe you're like slightly more warmly able to go in that direction. Mm. But it's not, this is all like a very gradual over time. And I didn't even know if any of this was actually worthwhile eight years ago when I started, mm. because I agree with you, you finish a debate, you look at the comments section, it's like, why the fuck am I even wasting my time? Yeah. And it's been very much like a process that over almost a decade, I can see like the fruits that are coming off the tree now. And I'm like, yeah. okay, I think this is working. It's just really, really, really hard to track. Um, you're playing, you're playing the long game. Basically, yeah. yeah, but not like in a. People say that a lot, and then I'll see there'll be posts on like 4chan or Twitter, or whatever, saying like, "Oh, Desi's trying to like lie to people or trap people, and this is his strategy, or whatever." There's like a strategy, but like just as much as just a strategy of any political guy that talks on YouTube to everybody. Like, I'm not lying, I'm not disingenuous about any of it. I'm just not gonna because people will be like, "Oh, well, why aren't you showing your full position?" And it's like, well, nobody. It's not like my position is hidden. I'm just not gonna argue every single possible point mm. that I have. If, if I show up to argue with somebody about something, right? Like if somebody comes at me and, and they say like, oh, well, my position is that slavery was actually justified because it gave black people more opportunities in the US. I'm not going to sit here and argue for why I think DEI or affirmative action might be justifiable. Mm. I'm going to argue on like a very philosophical of like, well, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Even if they did gain, is that like actually a good precedent? Like, would we really want to say that you could do something horrible to somebody if their children benefit in the future? Isn't mm. this like the argument that left-leaning people use for climate change and all that that you hate so much? Mm. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, a, you, you take people where they are. Um, I asked you earlier if you were like a, if you ever were like the debater archetype, I'm the debater archetype. Yeah. Um, and I'm very destructive instead of constructive in yeah. my conversations. Yeah. Um, and I've had like, I've been trying to figure out recently, like what, how do I want to like orient myself through, um, this world? Like what, cause I have a big problem in debates to where I'm just, I'm constantly tearing down and I yeah. can show somebody why their argument is bad. But then when you walk away from it at the end, I'm just like a destructive force. <laughs> And I asked you for your thing because you said that, and your statement was incredibly positive. I felt, I felt patriotic because you want to talk about like political fluency. You want to talk about like positive aspects. Yes. How do you, in a world of online politics where everything is relentlessly negative, yes. is this like a mindset where you're like, I want to tear down Trudeau for yeah. trying to do gun legislation because of something yeah. that happened in Texas. But today I'm going to talk about something positive. How yeah. do you, what does that process look like for you? I don't know. I mean, I, this is, it's quite interesting talking with you, Stephen. This is probably the longest I've, I've consumed you in any form. Okay. And you, you are, you have a very intense personality, right? Sure. Like you, you speak very quickly. You have a somewhat sort of combative energy to you. And that sort of gives me a sense of like, you know, just the kind of person that you are and like the kind of things that you're interested in. Like you strike me, you're, you're very bright, obviously very intellectual, very nimble. And I could see why you would then be drawn to sort of like intellectual combat and intellectual argument and that kind of thing. Cause that just seems like how your brain is uh, designed. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like maybe you're just less interested in some of these things that interest me, right? Like I'm, I'm like an artist, like I've always been into drawing and, and uh, fine art and this kind of stuff. Like I like aesthetics. I like things like, yeah, if you see my videos, I have like a huge collection of all sorts of knickknacks and gigaws. You know, the folks at home can't see this, but this studio, for instance, is pretty bare. I don't know if like your home is this way as well, like that you're just kind okay, of. I went to college for music. I like music. I play okay, piano. So, but again, okay. like even that, that's kind of like a more sort of like cerebral kind of thing, right? Like you. you oh, oh, I'm sorry. Art is not cerebral, but no, music no. is cerebral. No, because music, you appreciate music, right? Like you don't collect music, right? Like you don't have like a bunch of little music. Maybe, maybe you do little musical gigas and stuff like that. Like music is, is, is less, I think in some ways, a less sort of consumerist hobby. And I would say that I'm pretty consumerist in something okay. in some ways. Like I like, like when I go to the, I love going to the supermarket, right? Like I love when I'm here in the States, I love <laughs> to like, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that in my life. No, it's Sorry, like God. I go to the States, you know, I was at the, the, what's it called? The CVS, mm -hmm. you know, yesterday. And it's just, it's fun to me to like walk the aisles and see like all these kind of like cool American candies and snacks. And like, you know, I bought this big package of chapstick, which had like five different, uh, like flavors like, of chapstick um, in the sand. And I was thinking like, oh, mango chapstick. That's so cool. Mangoes. Where does that come? How did mango wind up like an iconic American thing? Like my mind just kind of like makes these connections, right? Like I want to tell this story and I find this stuff like exciting to me. Like I'm stimulated by this. I'm stimulated by like the prosperity and the wealth and the, de the decadence, you could even say, like just the sheer amount of stuff we have in this in this culture. Like we are the inheritors of a tremendous, uh, you know, long pro progress, like a, a long sort of evolution of progress on this continent where we have now become so wealthy and we enjoy so many things. We have so many creature comforts like we live fantastic lives. And that's something that I've always enjoyed. And like that's where I suppose like a certain conservatism in my personality comes from is that I just look around the world and I look around our culture and I see so many things to value and so many things to be happy about. And I've always been that way. 
Like my parents really sort of drilled into me, I think from a young age that like, I should be grateful. Like, don't be spoiled. That mm -hmm. was always the worst thing that you could be in my household, which was to be spoiled or to be entitled or to not be grateful for the tremendous things that we have. And so I think that some of the content that I make is sort of animated by that. And I think that some of the sort of the kind of the small C conservative instincts that I have are animated by that as well. When people are tearing down America, when people are tearing down American institutions or American culture or saying that there's nothing good about this culture, there's nothing good about this country, like that gets my back up because that starts to strike me as like, what the hell are you talking about? Like this stuff is great here. Like you're so lucky to live here. Why don't you be grateful? Why don't you learn to appreciate the things that you have instead of only focusing on the bad things and only trying to like tear things down and getting sort of stuck in this this cycle of of uh, rhetorical excess where you know you just say oh this is like a failed state capitalist hellhole you know i don't know but like but Jeez, okay maybe but maybe i was you, asking how what your mental process was i wasn't ready for a full on attack of my character but i understand <laughs> no no i'm just sort of saying no like, i understand but you think the, it you think it this like naturally emanates kind of from your disposition basically just comes through your content yeah, and it's just like the kind of things that i've always been interested in the kind of things that that interest me like maybe you're just not interested in the same things and like maybe that means that it would be kind of a little bit more of a struggle for you to care about the sort of things that i care about and to Talk. I'm interested in things. Are you interested I, in things? I, I actually am. I super am because, um, like my community likes it, for instance, because, like I said, I have a, a semi formal background from music, and every mm -hmm. now and then I'll be like, oh, like, why do I not like the new Final Fantasy VII remake soundtrack yeah. as opposed to the last one? I can talk about this for hours. It's very interesting to me. Okay. Um, and I can be positive, um, but when it comes into the political stuff, I'm very negative. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's just because I don't know any U.S. history. Maybe you should. Why don't you know more U.S. history? Um, I just didn't care about it in school, I guess. Why, what were you doing in school? <laughs> sleeping in class and then playing video games oh, so afterwards you were not a good student so like, well i did okay yeah see like i mean maybe and maybe like this is a key variable as well like i had when i was in high school i liked high school i had i had good teachers that took an interest in me i loved to learn i liked to study i mean i did a lot of like that was when i first got into like reading and stuff and self-directed learning I love to learn about U.S. history, world history, politics, the political institutions, and all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, right? I will say that after um, I got, not to go on a tangent or whatever, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. finally got a formal ADHD diagnosis six months ago, and oh. I've been on medication, and in the last six months, I've read more than I've read in the past, easily the past 35 years of my life. It's not even close. Um, and going through the whole history of Israel-Palestine, and now like mm -hmm. reading Supreme Court docs and everything, I will say that being able to sit and read everything gives me a way bigger appreciation for how stuff works that when people say like this is such a stupid thing like why does this offense exist why is this a statutory yes. offense or why is this strict liability or why is it like, actually really good reasons why all of this happens so maybe um having an understanding of the things definitely gives you more of a care about what happens and an appreciation yeah. um i do agree with that i feel like i don't know if it's just me but i feel like history and government and everything are such throwaway topics um away in, in, in school and that like oh. I had a teacher that was on my stream like two weeks ago and he was asking me because he does social studies and history for high schoolers and he was asking me like what do you think can be done to make these more interesting because you told me that you hated these subjects in school and it's hard for me to know like well i don't know if this would have genuinely made me interested but i i do remember feeling that any time a topic was like if the teacher had a big interest in it and mm -hmm. the teacher was like this thing here is why today we do this that always made me care way more mm -hmm. um i don't know if it's this way in art school did you go to art school no oh in music school, uh, music is oftentimes treated in like this museum type way. Yeah. Even even in jazz, uh, they'll say like, "Well, these were the greats. You you know you you know you learn these solos, you transcribe them, you play them, blah blah." And this is like what this is. But they don't give you much of like a modern day interpretation of things, and mm. it crisp. Uh, it crystallizes it like freeze frames all this stuff in a way that's disconnected and not at all relatable and it feels hard to care and i feel like if i had a teacher maybe earlier on for history that made me understand that like this seems irrelevant but it's actually so important today yes. uh maybe i would have cared more about it growing up yeah i mean i've been very influenced by uh, an american thinker called ed hirsch who is a big proponent of a of a theory of education that's called cultural literacy which is basically the idea that's very unfashionable now, which is that there are basically like just big concepts, big ideas, big names, dates, you know, things that young people basically have to learn. Like you kind of just kind of have to go through the list of a certain set of sort of canonical knowledge and that that gives you a sort of degree of, of, of fluency that then allows you to sort of like build on that knowledge and learn deeper and deeper and more and more complex topics and sort of the way that you're describing. The problem, and I do think that like this is something that the right wingers do have a point on, which is that some of the way that that 
uh, young people are taught these days has kind of gotten too kind of high concept, maybe even dare I say a little too postmodern, where it's all about like, you know, just these kind of like very abstract theories of knowledge, abstract theories of learning, these kind of like larger kind of narratives about injustice and, and inequality and power relationships and this kind of stuff. And like trying to teach young people all of that stuff instead of just like, here's some names, here's some like inventions, here's some famous guys, you know, here's some famous battles and wars and names of countries and monuments and things like that that you just have to learn. Right. And so again, like that's something that I'm trying to do a little bit in part because I've realized that there are a lot of people, you know, people younger than you who feel that either because they didn't pay attention in school or they didn't have good teachers or whatever, they feel like a sense of insecurity. Like they are very aware that there's big gaps in their in their knowledge. And again, I think that's why, you know, some people are not like you who learn to better themselves and fill the gaps of their knowledge the correct way. Some of them, they just try to fill it in with conspiracy theories and 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 attitudes that sort of dismiss the relevance of things that they don't know. Yeah, I think that that's what, frankly, how some people on sort of the far left dismiss the relevance of things they don't know. It's like, well, why should I learn, you know, these presidents? They were all just, you know, racist white slave owners or whatever. There's nothing important about that. Like, yeah. Yeah. And even even in terms of like me being able to fill in the gaps, of my knowledge, like even over the past six months, I've gone from uh, like if there's a don't get triggered. But if there's a passage on Wikipedia, I'll be like, OK, well, let me read the full passage in the book. Mm. And then I think like I think by February, March, I was like, OK, it's not enough to read the passage. I need to read like the whole page, right? Because I need to make sure I understand what's going on. And then, like a month or two later, it's like, okay, we got to read like the page before and after. And now, when I'm reading stuff, I'm like, I, I think I need to read the book yeah. <laughs> because, like, especially a after finally having to start to read, I could be like, man, there are so many ways that I could pull a couple pages out of this book to completely misrepresent everything inside of it. And now I do like at the minimum, I would say like I have to read the chapter and understand. I need to know who the author is and what the book is about if I want to understand this one sentence because it's mm -hmm. not enough to it's not enough to read the paragraph. It's not enough to read the page before and after i need the the yeah, i need the chapter at minimum and then what's the book about to understand the context of what's being said mm. and something that actually just clicked in my mind it's funny as you as you mentioned that um i used to say all the time that uh, i took a lot of math um and, and physics in high school that i like math and physics because at least like it builds off of itself right so if you know one thing you can learn the next thing and that's why i like those subjects and i, I now i'm just figuring this out that history is the exact same way yeah. um yeah especially going through israel palestine where it's like oh I know why they did this now. Like, this isn't even a mystery. Like, something that might be like, oh my God, like, how did they win this war? Or why did this leader think this thing? Yes. It's like, well, you could almost write the next few pages if you'd studied everything that'd come before it. And then even in US history, when things start popping up, yeah, just having an understanding of the structure of things can inform so much more of your modern political understanding. Yesterday, I was um, I was a little critical of, Stephen King made a tweet saying that uh, abortion is now back in Arizona and the same law that allows for abortion allows for the age of consent to be 10 years old. And because I, I have a little bit of an understanding of how law works, it's like my guess is this is probably like a huge fucking bill yes. or a huge thing. And this part has probably been updated. The abortion part probably wasn't because the Supreme Court rolled over. And then we looked it up and that's what it was. Yes. But then I went under the Twitter and a whole bunch of people were thinking like, oh, now you can have sex with 10 year olds in Arizona yeah. because of the illiteracy of the Twitter yeah, tweeter yeah, and the yeah. illiteracy of the yeah the audience. So, no, it's it's and, you know, when you're when you gain this kind of literacy, it's it's useful it just makes you i think you can go through life you can just appreciate things more you can have more deep conversations with a greater variety of people you know like i here in miami very diverse place you know you meet people i've had some conversations i ask them where they're from and they tell me oh i'm from this country or that country i know enough about that country that i can say oh how are things going over there and i've heard about this and that kind of thing or do you would like this food i know that this is popular food with your people and that kind of thing. When uh, an American or a Canadian American can do yeah. that, people are very impressed. <laughs> well, they are because yeah. again, like, you know, people's fluency is just very limited, right? I was, uh, here's another example. Like I was walking on my walk here, like I passed a, a place called, I think it was a hotel or maybe it was an apartment building. It was called the Lord Balfour, right? Okay. And so you think like, why would a place in Miami be called the Lord Balfour? And you know, you know, because you're fluent on this topic now, but it's just like, just little things like that. Like you can just enjoy things because you can make the connections and you can suddenly realize that uh, we're living in this very complex, rich uh, world in which we've inherited a great deal of culture from all sorts of different places. And, and it's not just a bunch of discrete no, things like discrete history things. feels, it's you, all connected. Yeah, yeah. And you can, and again, like you can find it everywhere. Like it's not just for political debates, like just walking down the street, you can find all sorts of cool things that you can just and I just think it isn't it nice that if we can live lives where we can enjoy even the small things, if we can even go to the supermarket and we can be delighted by, you know, chapstick or whatever, right? Like I think that's 
in my in my own small way, I think that that's the life that I want to live, a life where I'm, I'm just happy and, and satisfied and, and can find pleasure to compensate for all of like there's enough legitimate hardships that we all go through in our individual lives. Right. Everybody's life is full of heartbreak and suffering and all the rest of it. So, like, why not try to have some aspects of your life that can just be sources of simple pleasures? So when you cover something and it's a politically charged issue yeah. and you get a lot of people to show up and disagree with you. Yeah. Do you never have the inclination or the urge to like fight back? I'm going to do a video showing why this is so dumb. Or do you just like just rolls off your back? You don't care? Yeah, or what is I the mean, feeling, I guess? My, my instinct is to, like, it's funny, like I talk to people and they say you should debate more. You should make more kind of like harder edged videos, more combative videos. I, I just I don't feel like that's really what the world needs. Like, I'm, I, I mean, with all due respect, because I think you made a very eloquent defense for the kind of content that you make and why you do what you do. But I just feel like there's just so much of that right now. And I feel like I want to solve perhaps a different problem or, or tackle what I perceive to be the problems of our society in a slightly different way. And it's like, yeah, there are issues that I feel very passionate about. And there are things that like, I feel like I can argue maybe in the same confident way that you argue things that you feel. But I don't know, like I you because I guess maybe I was sort of turned off by it a little bit when I was doing the talking head thing on television, when I would be arguing and debating with people. And I really did kind of get the sense that this was something that existed for my benefit, not the benefit of the audience mm -hmm. or to the extent it existed for the benefit of the audience. It was that same sort of like shallow thing where it's like I represent a certain you know, I'm a cipher of a certain team and people want me to win. I'm this. owning this guy yeah. so that you can watch it and you can go own other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so like that was just unsatisfying. But no, I mean, like I've made a few videos that have have strong argumentative topics, but overall it's and I just feel like I'm, I'm even my my information consumption habits are changing now that I'm starting to think a little bit less politically all of the time. Like I'm just I was going to ask, like, why politics in, in terms of like the content that you do? Why not just exclusively do like media or art or culture well, I mean, review or I something? Think that's the direction I'm drifting in. Right. Like okay. I come from a political background. Right. Like I've I, you know, when I was a teenager, like that was what I wanted to be was I wanted to be an opinion journalist. Like I wanted to be a political commentator like that to me was the ideal. And then, you know, luckily in, in the long lives that we lead, we can reinvent ourselves every so often. And I feel like I kind of maxed out on the political commentary and I found that it wasn't satisfying and it didn't feel useful. So now I'm trying to pivot into doing more cultural analysis and, and stuff like that. You know, if I've often sort of fantasized, like if I was to write a book, people have sometimes said, like, you should write a book about like your politics, your manifesto, like make arguments about Canadian debates and this kind of thing. And I feel like, no, I'd like to write a book about like American culture and like things to appreciate in American culture. Like I feel and cultural fluency and promote cultural literacy and all that. But but because I sort of come from a political background and I can never completely sort of discard that, like I will always be interested in politics. I will always sort of think about things in a political way. I will always um, have a sort of mindset that emphasizes the importance of politics as a sort of component part of a broader culture. You know, as long as that sort of aspect of me uh, is visible, there will always be people who are demanding more political content from me. But yeah, I definitely like if I could just stop talking about politics, I probably would. I don't know. I've I been think having, having J-Reg as your friend for a while will do that to you. So I'm sympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> to that. I'm just kidding. Um, OK, well, hold on. Let me delete the whole next 30 questions I had about that. No, no, it's um, fine. No, no, I'm just fine with you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It's hard not to it's hard not to care about politics, though, like you can't. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think the stakes are legitimately high. Like, I think particularly in America, like I do think that this this election between Trump and Biden is very important. And I want people to not vote for Trump. Right. Like that matters a great deal to me. So but and so in some ways, like I'm sensitive to the argument. And I think certainly I guess people on the far left make this or people on the left in general make this and people I assume on the right as well is that, you know, it is it is a luxury to sort of be apolitical or to sort of not even to be apolitical, but to just kind of pull yourself out of the political conversation somewhat. When people I get very upset when people say things like, um, regardless of if you like uh, Trump or Biden, uh, usually it's going to be people on the left will say things like, well, I'm not voting for Biden because I don't want to vote for the lesser of two evils yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And invariably, it's a middle class white person yeah, lives in a nice yeah. community. Right? And it's like, it's nice that for you, there's no difference between these two people because you care about the most top level abstracted positions. Yes. But for other people who might want like the child tax credit back yes. or for people. Yeah, it's it is a monumental difference between both candidates. Yeah. It's a, it's a, and that's a very important point. And I think that's something to keep in mind. I talked about this in one of my videos. Um, 
was quoting an article, I think it was in The Atlantic maybe, or something about the, the so-called rise of political hobbyism, right? Some guy wrote a book about this and it's the idea, yeah, that there are a lot of like middle class, upper middle class uh, white folks, especially, who do treat politics as, as a type of entertainment, as a, as a virtue signal, as a sort of source of, of emotional validation or good feelings or whatever. And it can be tempting to sort of think that that's the only way that people engage with politics. But no, there are people that engage with politics because they have specific tangible wants and that the election or uh, unelection of certain candidates or politicians will make a material difference for themselves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I feel like in, in America's case, in the case of this presidential election, I feel like the stakes are, are quite high when we're talking about the potential, you know, survival of the constitutional order like that to me sort of strikes something as that all americans should feel invested in yeah the um i agree you had a job at washington uh, the washington post yeah. for a while yeah what was that like how'd you get hired from there um so i mean i've been doing opinion writing in, in various forums for you know quite a while and i the washington post had an initiative i think this was like back in 2015 ish where they wanted to have uh voices from more international uh, they want to have more international voices in the opinion section talking about uh, issues in that country from somebody who was in that country, you know, which, you know, seems self-evident, but is relatively less common in, in big sort of uh, American news outlets to have someone doing Canadian political commentary from Canada, have someone doing, uh, you know, commentary on Indian politics who is based in India. You know, there's lots of reporting that is done on these countries, but it's generally done by an American correspondent in that country. So it was kind of a novel ideal, global opinions. The kind of dark thing that I often tell people is that I was hired as part of an initiative that also included the hiring of Jamal Khashoggi, you know, the Saudi guy who was going to do, you know, Saudi commentary. And of course, you know, he had his... Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. He's in multiple pieces now. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. It's horrible. So... So I was brought on as part of that. And mm -hmm. yeah, I wrote columns about uh, Canadian politics from a Canadian perspective. A lot of people uh, resented me having that job in Canada because they were like, why does JJ McCullough of all people, because I have a reputation for being like, I don't know, contrarian or idiosyncratic and, you know, in terms of my view on Canada and, and all of that kind of stuff. But then, you know, there were editorial changes and they ultimately, I guess, decided that maybe this experiment didn't work and that, you know, the... Washington Post's value as a paper is as a great American paper with American employees offering commentary on American politics, right? So yeah, I was I I sort of left uh, the paper uh, a couple months ago, and it's fine. You know, I focus on my my videos, and and again, but saying what I said before, right? Like I even even then, I kind of felt like was this really what I wanted to keep doing? Did I really want to keep writing opinion columns, which weren't feeling like my true self or, you know, because when you're writing an opinion column, you do kind of have to have an opinion, you have to rile yourself up. And you write in a way that's more provocative and provocative yeah. and combative and that kind of thing. And I don't I don't want to be known as a combative person. I don't want to be known as a divisive person, right? Were they generally always like politically charged topics? As yeah, they were to... politically charged topics. And, mm -hmm. and again, like, you know, I have like in a Canadian political context, like, yeah, I do lean more conservative than than to Trudeau's side. Like, I, I don't support Trudeau's bid for a fourth term. I think it would be good if we could get some new leadership in that country. And uh, but, you know, like, I'm not I'm not nuts about it. Like, there are right wing kind of like cranks in Canada, the same way there are everywhere else. And it's like I didn't really want to be part of that political tribe, right? But you see that when you try to write, even in a sort of mild way, it comes off as being more combative just because, you know, the 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 form dictates the substance to some degree. And as well, like you also see, like, you know, if I write any article that involves Trudeau, if we can work Trudeau into the headline, you know, to get more clicks and, you know, that will impress my editors more and this sort of thing, right? So mm -hmm. the incentive structures were not great. But, you know, at the same time, saying this out loud, I also realized that you know, then if you're complaining that there's too much kind of crappy political commentary, like whose fault is that? Is that the fault? Because, you know, more sort of sensible people are kind of abandoning this field to the cranks, you know? So it's a fair criticism, I guess. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask you that earlier, that if you feel like you've got a good mind for it, and if you feel like you're leading people to higher levels of political fluency and yeah. to be a little bit more positive on things, um, is it not depriving the arena of something worthwhile for you to be like, fuck this, I'm going to leave? Because yeah. if enough people that are of your mindset do that, then you've ceded the territory to all of the crazy people. I guess something that I've been trying to do on, on my on my YouTube channel is I try to do just objective summaries of political topics sometimes, not like rants or, uh, you know, sort of diatribes, 
But so like, for example, I, I, I do every so often I make a video that's just kind of like summing up the political climate in Canada as it exists in that current moment. And you know, I say like, well, you know, Trudeau is doing this. And then the conservatives say that this is bad. And, you know, I acknowledge the controversies. And I think that when you actually when you come from a more kind of like opinionated background, as I do, I think in some ways you can actually if you allow yourself, you can be better at being objective because you're more aware of like where the fault lines are. Mm -hmm. what kind of like lines or language trigger people and 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 how the two sides genuinely genuinely perceive each other right absolutely so, yeah so i certain depending on who i'm talking to there are certain words where i know that like i'm i can get you to agree with everything i'm saying yes. about like this guy exhibits these really bad character qualities we all agree they're bad but if i accidentally say the phrase toxic masculinity i've yes, completely yes, turned you off yes, from anything i'm going to yes. talk about yeah no exactly right so in that sense like having that degree of 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 literacy which i do think yeah the more People that have a more sort of partisan history or more ideological history are better at it. Like, I, I do think that, like, a lot of, like, uh, left-wing people or right-wing people, they can probably fake the other side better than they would want to admit. Just because they've spent so much time consuming that which they hate, they probably have gained a pretty high degree of fluency in what how the other side works and operates even if they don't want to admit it hopefully i would hope that's the case i don't think i agree with you no you don't because i feel like people are i feel like what they consume are caricatures of the other side that's probably true yeah. yeah i used to think that was just like the people on the ground but i'm not as sure for the people at the top anymore it's hard to say mm. that's um, true i mean I, I think that you think that like someone like ben shapiro i think he could probably if he allowed himself to right like if, if someone like ben shapiro allowed himself to like write a kind of turing test style like mm -hmm. op-ed from a progressive perspective not if he was doing it as a parody, yeah. not if he was doing it to like, you know, uh, show his right wing base what left wingers really want. Like if he was just doing it as an intellectual exercise, I think he probably could do it. I what? think so. But you're, you're not to dick write anybody, but yeah. I think Ben Shapiro is probably one of the best or most intelligent right wing yeah. as much as I might disagree with him. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Like could Candace out. Owens do that? I, would I say don't no. think so. <laughs> <Yeah>. Absolutely not. <laughs> I would love to see Candace Owens, Matt Walsh, Michael Knowles. Like, can you just write out why you think somebody in love might support like DEI? <laughs> and they would be a comical caricature of trying to figure out. Yes. Um, although to some extent, like... I, I mean, as much as I like to say, I communicate with different people, I can fall into the same trap sometimes. Um, Peter Bogosian and I, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm, I used to be ultra sunburned like yesterday oh. and the day before. Um, we went outside and we did like a, a street quiz thing on people. And uh, one of the things that me and another guy, very obviously, very ardent Trump supporter, um, the question that was asked was, do you think that Joe, uh, do you think that Biden would be a good president next term like why or why not basically yes. or like do you think he would be a really good president next term or would trump be better or something it was something like that and i was on the strongly agree and he was on the strongly disagree and the first question peter asked was okay write down why you think the other side uh thinks what they do and we both take a second and we do it and the other guy wrote down um because you think biden has like a lot of good policies or passed a lot of good legislation whatever yeah. and i was like yeah that is mine and i got three guesses and my first was like, because you think that Trump would do, I think it was like a really good job at the border. Yeah. And he was like, no. And I was like, because you think Trump um, is defending like Americans at home when it comes to like policies or taxes. Yeah. And he's like, no. And I was like, and, and it's one other thing. And I was just completely wrong. And the guy showed me his board and it was because he thinks Biden is senile. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> fuck me. Like I'm living in like a policy world, like trying to guess like, well, what, what bill was it? What executive yes, order was yes, it? Yes. And then, yeah. And this guy's like, no, Biden is senile. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> Um, yeah, Jesus, the, uh, yeah, policy is, policy is really fallen by the wayside, you know, uh -huh. it's like, I think of it that even like, I feel like now, actually, hopefully this doesn't date the podcast too much when I say it, but it's like, you know, like now there's this whole conversation about like the abortion thing. Right. And like Trump gave that speech the other day where he's sort of trying to like moderate his position on that and this kind of thing. And, and uh -huh. I've heard some like very serious people saying, mm, well, you know, like Mike Pence denounced this and like, is this going to like risk his support with the evangelicals and this kind of thing? Because there used to be this idea that like abortion was like the one policy thing that you couldn't deviate from. Like you had to be 100 percent pro-life to be a Republican in good standing. Uh, but even now, I'm starting to wonder, like, if Trump could, in theory, come out tomorrow and say, like, pro, uh, pro choice, like, that's where it's at. And would he lose any support? I don't know. Maybe not. Like, I think that the policies have become so irrelevant in this in this culture of, of hyper polarization and particularly on the Republican side, like just the deep personal fidelity to Trump above everything else. Yeah. They yeah, people think these Overton windows are these like set things and it's like where you exist in when in reality they're not only are they incredibly fluid, 
Uh, but more importantly, they're unknown. Nobody really knows yeah. where they are. So a politician could discover that there's actually way more room here than we previously thought, which I think Trump did accidentally. I don't give him credit for anything. Yeah. Trump, I think accidentally discovered or ended up in an area. It's like, oh, shit, I can shit on prisoners of war and I don't have to support American foreign yes. policy and all this shit or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, we actually go for this. And it's not like the Overton window is necessarily moving, although in a way you phrase it. Yeah, that is kind of happening. But it's just that there are a lot of positions that people could stick out that we don't even know the American public has an appetite for yet um, because things can change on the ground very 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 quickly depending on the conditions that exist in the country for going through israeli palestinian history one of the mistakes i made like three or four months ago i was like well look at the polling this is what these people want yes. um, but then historically when when huge peace deals are signed or like huge conflicts happen or whatever opinion on the ground can shift incredibly quickly such that if i would have said like oh well on you know on june 1st uh 1967 you know this is what everybody thought before the six-day war or whatever um and i said there's no way that this would happen there's no way that these two countries would have grown peace there's no way and then you go 10 days later it's like damn everybody's opinions changed dramatically yes. based on what's happened that yeah there's always a lot of movement or more movement i think than people realize sometimes hmm. yeah I guess it, it depends, though, the one thing that I would sort of say to qualify that is like it depends, again, like whether or not the policy positions matter at all or whether or not like because like there was this conventional understanding with Trump, which was sort of like what you said, which is that like uh, Trump has kind of like upended the Republican consensus on cer certain issues and that he's revealed a sort of like suppressed desire on the part of Republican voters for, you know, an alternative policy position. And, you know, I think that that was a good theory of the case, but I also like just wonder to the degree that it's just Trump, like it's just personal loyalty to him. He tells it like it is like there's a deep sort of personal affinity for Trump and a deep trust in Trump, where it's just like what Trump is saying is determined to be the right position. Mm -hmm. Not that Trump is like brave and has embraced like clever new policy positions that are helping the Republican Party grow. It's just that like Trump is Trump and Trump is helping the Republican Party grow and that there is no policy position in one direction or another that he could take that would either expand or limit his appeal because it's just a man. It's you like, know? does God command things that are good or are they good because God commands yes, them? Does yes, that, precisely. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's my, my guess after Trump um, is there's probably a lot of things that just kind of run concurrently with each other. And we assumed the causality on one when in reality it's just correlated with another thing that's highly causal. Yeah. So it might be the case that uh, for a long time people have had these political dispositions and we've thought the policy positions were what mattered. Yes, yes. But in reality, yeah, they're just proxies for some other thing. And if you change the position, as long as that other thing is unchanged, nobody this, actually this, cares. This is exactly something that I feel like I'm I am trying to reckon with a lot as somebody that has traditionally identified as conservative. And I think this is actually the case with like a lot of sort of uh, never Trump uh, conservative types. Do you consume the bulwark at all? I don't. I'm familiar of like I'm familiar with never Trump Republicans. Yeah, but the bulwark is like their main publication. It's really good. Okay. You, should, you might like some of their content. Are they the ones that started the um, fuck me was it the Lincoln Project? They're like, I think, like sort of the... loosely associated with it. They okay. all, the, their big thing was. Um, I, th I forget what it's called now. I think it's like called Former Republicans Against Trump. Okay. And they make ads that are quite persuasive, I think, because they interview people that have voted for Trump in the past and talk about why they don't like him or people that were Republicans and don't like him and, and all that. But, uh, but um, one of their big positions that they sort of engage with a lot is the question of whether or not conservatism and like this big robust conservative movement of William F. Buckley and Goldwater and Ronald Reagan and you know this whole sort of canon that appeals to a certain a certain crowd um, a certain crowd of like intellectuals and pundits the National Review types and all that where I used to work um, the question is sort of like whether or not that stuff these policy and philosophic positions were ever what made conservatism attractive right? Or whatever made the Republican Party attractive, or whether or not there just is a kind of like somewhat reactionary faction of American politics or American society that just wants to vote for the party that's like the, the party that's against the left broadly understood or the progressive side broadly understood. And they don't really have a clear sense of what they want from Washington or what they want from the Republican Party. They just will kind of like want a strong party that will crush the bad element of American society. And yeah, that, that, and I, how do you even, I feel like measuring that would be so hard because you can't take anybody at their word because people don't genuinely yeah. know, right? But I think that I think that in that sense, sort of like, and what the sort of some of these bulwark people would say is that Trump was kind of the, the, the test. Like, if you put somebody who is just like as unappealing and sort of dopey as Trump up on the ballot, but if he, and if his only political skill is like rhetoric against the other side, like, is that enough for the Republican? 
base. Is that enough for the Republican electorate? And it seems like it was, which then makes you second guess, like, well, why did we have all these eggheads and all these people like making their Syria? Like, why did we have Paul Ryan? Like, why did the Republican culture produce Paul Ryan when it could have just produced Donald Trump? And maybe that would have got, you know, beat Obama in, mm -hmm. you know, but then it's also hard to tell that, like, because the thing could have happened for one reason. And then as time goes on, it morphs into something else. But you don't even realize it. Like maybe at one point in time, these values were incredibly important, but these values attract a certain type of people. But then these type of people don't actually care about the values, but they kind of remain just because. And then at some point, if something changes, everybody's like, well, hold on. Have you, I don't know if they actually did this experiment, but have you heard of the one with like five monkeys in a room and there's like an electric shock if there's a banana at the top of a ladder? No. The idea is um, th there's some similar -ish experiments you can run that seem to work, but uh, five monkeys are in a room. One of them tries to go for the banana and the floor shocks all the monkeys if you yes. try to grab the banana. So they pull them down. You swap one monkey out. You add another in. The new one will run for the banana. But as soon as he does, everybody pulls him down yeah. before the shock even happens. Mm. A second monkey is thrown in until eventually you've replaced every monkey. You can turn off the electric shocks, but the learned behavior behavior is still there mm. such that when a when a new monkey comes out even though there's four in there that have never felt the negative stimulus before as soon as the new monkey goes for the thing they pull them down because that's just what they've learned to do yeah. um i think on youtube i've seen where people will do these experiments where if you go into an office to wait and there's a whole bunch of like plants oh, yes, there yes. the standing up and the sitting yes, down yeah this, people yes. will do it and they'll teach that behavior even when everyone else has moved out of the room yes. to new people that come in yes. um yeah, so then you wonder that like maybe things existed for a reason at one point in time, but now they don't, but the convention is there and people stuck with it, and then people find out, well, actually, this convention doesn't matter anymore. Yes. Um, so was, so then, then the question is like, well, now you're on a totally new battlefield where who knows what's okay or what's not okay. And we've been saying this in American politics since Trump won the first election. What's the field going to look like going forward? Is, has everything changed uh, irrevocably? But... I mean, it seems like it hasn't because we haven't produced a whole bunch of Trump-like candidates. We got Vivek, who kind no, of we, sort we, of was. I think, I think we have. I think you that think when so? You, I think that when you look at the sort of people, and again, my buddies at the Bulwark, this is how I, asking for like a good source. I feel like a lot of my political awareness is now coming from this one site, but mm -hmm. they do a really good job of documenting just how many MAGA freaks are getting elected all over the place. Like the sort of people that are running the sort of people that are winning nominations uh, to be, you know, senator, governor, state legislator, state senate, you know, county Your Marjorie commissioner. Taylor Greens and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's not just Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like you can go down the list. And what you will often find is that if if the choice in a Republican primary at any level is between like a complete MAGA space lasers wacko and then like some, you know, guy who's been a loyal servant of the Republican Party and worked his way through the state legislature. And then I was state attorney general and da, 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 da. And if they're both like running in a primary for governor, like the, the Republican base will vote for the crackpot before they'll vote for the sort of the standard Republican. I guess the question is, is are these like are these like spiritually down ballot votes for Trump? Like if Trump disappears, yeah. is there still going to be the fervor for these types of people? I think so, because I think that like sort of like Trump has allowed uh, a normalization of a lot of like crankish right wing views and conspiracy theories and rhetoric and style like that has now been normalized. And I think a lot of Republicans have realized or a lot of Republican voters have realized it's like, oh, we can have that. Like, that's OK. Like, we can vote for that. That's a choice. And it seems like a lot of Republicans will gladly take that choice if it's offered to them. They're mm -hmm. not going for an argument that appeals to anything else. They're not going for arguments that appeal to experience or competence or any sort of policy agenda. They're going for politicians that resemble Trump and make them feel the way that Trump makes them feel. And I think that the idea of like a politician making you feel a certain way is a very underrated uh, aspect of, of political appeal in general. I definitely agree with that. That's why people spoke favorably of like Clinton and Biden and very un disfavorably of Mrs. Clinton. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, although I, I am curious, I'm not fully sold on that. I guess we'll see when Trump is gone forever from politics, whether he wins or loses the next election cycle. But like, it, what would the alternative be though? Like what would, like what, who would be elected if not many Trumps? I feel like the I feel like the, the the cycle of populism is somebody promises you the world yes. and they have really enticing rhetoric. And actually, I am kind of mad right now. And this guy channels that anger. But then once they get into office, they kind of have this. Um, it's like entering adulthood period that everybody has. The crypto guys did it uh, when they discovered, well, maybe central banking exists for a reason. Or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, computer engineers did it when they were like, oh, maybe all these traditional engineering practices should apply to coding as well. Everybody has this moment where like, okay, all of the institutions and all of the things that he said before were here for good reason. Trump came into office and he was still funny. He still had good tweets. And he still was like, you know, entertaining to watch on camera. But um, man, he was a horrendously ineffective leader. Yeah. And I feel like populism runs its course when you've had your guy come in and he's like, OK, well, actually, I don't know how anything works. I can't.
can get anything done. And my good words will only carry it so far until people are like, okay, well, we're kind of done with this. And then you move on to the next thing, mm. uh, which is usually back to kind of uh, the status quo. But I could be totally wrong on that. I hope I'm not because holy f the conservative party in the U.S. is insane right now. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess, I mean, like what makes it really nefarious is that they do not have a mindset that can acknowledge the reality of their own defeat, right? Like that was in some ways the most sinister thing that Trump did yeah. was that in a normal, healthy democracy, when you lose, there has to be some degree of reckoning. You know, there was the famous Republican autopsy when Mitt Romney lost. Right. But like Trump has created this sort of world in which the Republicans never lose. Right. There's only conspiracies that prevent them and that somehow the true American majority is always craving Republican rule. Right. So that's. That mindset, that attitude, you know, Carrie Lake has this attitude in Arizona as well, you know, still refuses to concede that she lost that gubernatorial election. Right. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes normalized, then you have like basically uh, prevented. Like you've inoculated yourself against the possibility that there can ever be a moment to catch your breath and reckon and reflect on what's gone wrong because they've already talked about how the next election is going to be rigged. Yes. Like this, this conversation, they've already prepared that. Um, it's funny because you mentioned with YouTubers or with debates that it kind of sucks that there's no central authority to say he won that debate yes. and we've judged that effectively. Yes. It feels like we've lost that ability to even have those discussions about our factual reality anymore. Oh, absolutely. That I think a super majority, I think it's like 70% of Republicans still believe the last election was stolen. And it's yeah. like, we can disagree on some things. Is climate change real or not? Sure. But when we're disagreeing on fundamental, essential aspects of our democracy, that's really scary. Um, because from that foundation, if you disagree on facts enough, it can justify a whole bunch of really crazy stuff yeah. like Jan 6 or Jan 6 or worse or whatever, yeah. depending on. Yeah, which is scary. Yeah. Um, what, what are tell me on some unique Canadian cultural things? I only hear about Canada when negative stuff, political stuff is happening or as like America Junior. You like culture and commentary and all of that. Yeah. Give me like three things that you feel like Canada has produced culturally. That's like distinctly Canadian. That's like a really cool thing. But it's like I don't I don't really like thinking about Canadian culture in that way because like okay because distinction is like something that's fetishized in in Canadian culture too much which is the idea that like if Canada does something that thing is only worth anything to the extent that it's distinct sure and it has when I say when I yeah. say distinct I don't necessarily mean like just like your native population I just mean like because uh, as an American the uh, the whole world is America to, yeah. in my eyes there's America above us and there are a bunch of people who follow American yeah. politics across the ocean yeah. and some people are so unprivileged in the world that they don't even access to American politics. That's yeah. how like Americans do. So yeah. I'm just curious from like a Canadian perspective, do you think there are things that are like, this is a really cool aspect of Canada that America doesn't quite have yet or, or kind of originated in America or was like something that America had that Canadians took and like made better or cooler or whatever. Do you think there's anything like that or? I don't. I can name a thing. Do, okay. do you ever remember, um, you know, Adult Swim? Yeah. There used to be a show a long, long time ago. It was before Adult Swim, but it was called Oh Canada. And I think it took like indie authors or cartoon people from Canada and they had like really, really late night TV where they showed like Canadian cartoons. That's the only oh, thing I can think wow. of. But I mean, no, I mean, like here's like this is the thing, right? It's like Canada is, is a tremendous country and has produced many tremendous things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but the thing is like those tremendous things it's produced are not necessarily distinct distinctly Canadian, right? Like, so Canada has a great sort of animation uh, history that I've been very interested in because I like cartoons and I like animation. And there's like a lot of great cartoons that I grew up watching that were made in Canada and might not be super well known in America. Like, are those distinctly Canadian things? I don't know. Like America has cartoons, like America invented, you know, the modern tradition of animation and all the rest of that. So it's like they're good, but they're not good because they have possess some sort of inherent Canadian distinctiveness that is uh, like exotic and, and special and unfamiliar to the US. But I mean, it's it's an interesting question, though, because like if I'm trying to force myself to think that way and to engage with sort of the, the framing of the question, I I mean, here. OK, here. Here's here's a good thing. This okay. actually used to be my go to thing when we're talking about politics. I do think that one thing Canada objectively does better than the US in politics is the gerrymandering thing. Like there is no gerrymandering in the U.S. or in Canada because a long time ago we decided that that should be done by nonpartisan appointed boards. And that seems like it's worked well. I find it like really abhorrent the way that in America it is spoken so openly that one of the great purposes of electing state legislatures is to just write, draw the, the borders in order to make it easier or harder for you to get people elected to Congress. Like I think that that is something that Canada is distinctly better at. Um, Hmm. 
Do you think that the political divisiveness in your country is as extreme as it is in the United States? Or? I, I, yeah, I, th I think it basically is. Like, I think that people, I mean, people hate Trudeau in a way that they don't hate Biden. Like, okay, I keep hearing that, yeah. but he's been prime minister or whatever for how many? Yeah, for terms? like nine years. Yeah, I, yeah. I heard for the last one, too, that like, this is it. He didn't change ranked voting or some shit. I don't know. Okay. There's like people complain about all these random things, but it seems like he keeps. Well, I mean, like Trudeau has been, I think, you know, quite good from the left wing perspective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the same way that like, you know, it's fashionable uh, for like far left Americans to like hate Biden and pretend that he's been like no different than any Republican president. It's fashionable in like the far left in Canada to pretend that Trudeau has done nothing good. And so they have to like come up with some explanation, even though I'd say like Trudeau I mean, I don't I don't support Trudeau, but I think that like from a progressive perspective, he's done a lot of the things that they wanted a progressive prime minister to do. So the ranked ballot, the electoral reform thing is like one of these kind of like flagpole issues that like the far left fixates on as an example of how Trudeau is actually bad and why they should vote for the NDP uh -huh. instead. But no, I mean, like the, the polarization is, is very intense, like the next election is going to be a very bitterly fought one. The guy who's the head of the Conservative Party, Pierre Polyev, is a very sort of like combative uh, conservative kind of guy who is very prone to like very strong rhetoric. And and just like a, people on the right really, really hate Trudeau. I mean, the trucker thing brought his reputation even lower than it had already been. Right. But there's and it's again, like as much as like I might not be super inclined to, to Trudeau, I have to concede that there is an aspect of dislike for Trudeau that is not entirely or entirely rational. Like he may again to go with like the feeling he makes some people feel a certain way for reasons that I don't totally understand. I think there's just something about his like manner and his way of talking. And some of it probably does like I think of like how much my father hates Trudeau. And it's in part because like Trudeau is like the son of the former prime minister. Like he has no real obvious credentials to have risen as high and fast in Canadian politics as he has. I do think that Trudeau is kind of a dopey guy. Like he's he's pretty simple. Like he's not <clears throat> like he's not as smart. Is he as, really? I think he is. Inter that's so interesting. I got the exact at least as an American. Yeah. Do you know who Pete Buttigieg is? Yeah, yeah. That, no, he's that, nothing like that's Pete what I get the impression no, of Buttigieg, for Trudeau. Okay. Buttigieg is a very bright guy. I think Buttigieg could be a good president someday. Trudeau, okay. Trudeau is a very simple minded man. I is think. he kind of like our Bush? Would you say? I, I think, yeah, that analogy is, is probably much stronger. Yeah. I think that like Trudeau is a guy that like knows how to say the kind of things that are expected of the head of the Liberal Party of Canada to say. I think, and again, like this goes to a very distinctive, this is an aspect of Canadian political culture that is pretty distinct from what it exists in America because like there, there is like a nationalistic aspect to Canadian politics that is very important and particularly on the left because like the left is much more nationalistic in Canada. Uh, relative to the right, which is kind of the inverse of American politics, right? And so Trudeau is like a product of a kind of like nationalistic, patriotic, progressive, dynastic upbringing in which he sort of has learned certain shibboleths of like the patriotic Canadian left. And he repeats those and but doesn't think very deeply about them. And like when he gives speeches that are supposed to be like a substantial engagement with a thought or an idea, like you realize how shallow they are. Like his understanding of like what the other side thinks, even in its most charitable, is often like very shockingly like shallow. Okay. Like, so, I just remember the thing on TV where Trudeau did the thing where he explained how oh, I, I wrote a, I know what you're gonna say. I actually wrote a whole article that went viral because I was dunking on how fake it was. Because he he gave this speech where it seemed like off the top of his head he was like speaking about uh, quantum computing, yeah. right? And everybody was so wowed. But that was a completely like fixed thing right yeah so, i understand that yeah. but i would imagine like in the united states a person on the right would never do that the american way would be like i don't know any of this stuff works but supposedly it's fast so we use, like that would be like the conservative approach to it and the left would want that guy to give like the intellectualized version yeah. of but okay but you're think, saying that's generally show when trudeau and canada and canadian politics doesn't come off as like an intellectual he comes off as more of an everyman so. i don't th and I, I don't even think like uh people on the left even like his supporters would say that he's great because he's a great intellectual. I think people would say that he's he has great sense of empathy, like he's a good communicator, like you believe that he sort of sincerely feels for, you know, the downtrodden and minorities and, and stuff like that. And that that kind of sense of empathy has always provided uh, a lot of or sort of motivated a lot of his political base and his political followers that he seems like he's He's like a sympathetic, emotional guy in a way that I think the Canadian political class is not very often produced. He's much mm -hmm. more 
that was actually the big criticism of his father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was this very cold, very sort of calculating, very combative person. Whereas Trudeau is, you know, a guy that he gave this, Trudeau sort of burst onto the scene actually at his father's funeral, where he gave a very emotional eulogy. Goodbye, Papa. That was the famous line that uh, was then on all the newspaper headlines the next day. And I think that made people sort of fall in love with him. And then, of course, you know, he, he's an attractive, uh, good looking guy. And, you know, he carries himself in a kind of like dapper sort of modern way. So he feels like a 21st century man at a time when, again, like Canadian political culture doesn't tend to produce a lot of uh, dynamic, youthful people. Do you think you guys have a problem talking about certain issues that are challenging because of crazy polarized views on the left and right? The two I'm thinking of are anything having to do with your indigenous population and then things relating to immigration? Or do you think you guys have better conversations about that in Canada than we do in the U.S.? No, I, I don't think we have better conversations. Uh, and I would also put abortion in that category as well. Is that a hotly debated Canadian topic? No, it's not. And I think oh. that, again, like this is part of the problem, right? So it's like... Oh, you think it should be a hotly well, debated? Well, <laughs> actually, my thinking, on, my thinking on this has actually changed a little bit, I, okay. must, I must sort of say, in part because I... And this has like been part of my own evolution as somebody who's like been more historically conservative, is I do think that you, sometimes you kind of feel like these issues should be debated more. And then you see what that debate looks like and it becomes actually quite off-putting and unattractive. And you realize that it doesn't even work politically, let alone on a sort of policy level. And I, I kind of feel that way, I think about abortion. Because uh, one of the ways that Canadian politics is different is that Canadian politics is just so much more hierarchical, right? So you have the, the heads of the party, the party bosses, and they exercise enormous message control and party discipline. I talked about this in like a recent video, but it's like the most rebellious member of the Canadian parliament still votes with the party leader like 97% of the time. Like it's not like in America where you have all of these individual members of Congress and senators who can vote however they want and beak off to the press. However, I mean, it's obviously it's yeah. becoming more. I was going to say there are people who would get, God, I wish I could remember the name off the top of my head. But there are people who will get accused of like not being with the party or that they buck like Trump or whatever, but their voting record will be like 92 percent of the yeah. time with him in office or whatever. And it's like this crazy. Yeah, but it's like it's like in American culture, you do sort of like there are people like. <clears throat> like, you know, like John McCain, right? It's like, I'm a maverick. Like the party bosses won't tell me what to do or like AOC or even like somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, who's mm -hmm. constantly threatening, you know, Speaker Johnson that it's like, you know, you're hanging by a thread and this kind of stuff. Like that, that sort of independence is just not at all present in Canadian politics in part because the parties are so hierarchical and the party boss can actually kick people out of the party and discipline people. And, you know, everybody wants to be a cabinet minister and that creates an incentive to suck up and this kind of thing. So but the point is, is that because the parties are so hierarchical, it's very easy for the party bosses to just declare certain debates closed and that they impose very strong message discipline on the politicians below them. And that so some topics are just never debated, regardless of how much public desire there is for those topics to be debated. And so when people talk about like, oh, the Canadian consensus on this, that or the other thing, it very rarely is a consensus that exists in broad Canadian culture. It's a, a consensus that exists on the part of the Canadian political class. Abortion was one of an example of that. Like abortion was just not ever debated in Canadian politics for decades, not because there was no desire on the part of right wing people to debate it, but because the party leadership at the highest level decided that this was like a net vote loser so that there was nothing to be gained by having a vigorous debate about abortion in Canadian conservative politics. And I think immigration is the same thing. Like, you know, not to say that there was nobody that had misgivings about Canada's very generous immigration system. But I think particularly on the side of the Conservative Party, there was a sense that, like, if we debate this issue too much, you know, the party comes off as racist or divisive or off-putting in some way. And that will offend the kind of like, you know, middle class voters we need in the middle to win and this kind of stuff. So I think and I think the Indigenous issue is, is similar. Like, there's a lot of pushback within sort of like um, America or sort of Canadian, like, conservative culture regarding some of the reconciliation sort of initiatives that we've been embarking upon under under Trudeau. But, you know, the Conservative Party has viewed that this is not an issue that's kind of like worth litigating in the political sphere. So it's not. Do you think that that rigidity or that ideological conformity, or at least the voting conformity in the party, do you think that might be a byproduct of a multi-party system? That in the United States, maybe you have, there's a lot of debate in the U.S. where people yeah. are like, oh, two-party system yeah, sucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like, well, there are a lot of problems with coalition governments. Um, I'm curious, do, do you think that, is it a two-parter? One is the, the specific one. In the United States, you kind of have to allow for some freedom because nobody's going to go to a third party because it's unviable completely yeah. here. Whereas it feels like in Canada, well, if you're going to break from the party too much, why not just go join the third party or something? Do you think that that rigidity is a byproduct of the 
multi-party system do you think multi-party systems in general are better than two-party systems like you have strong opinions on that or? I, I do have strong opinions on this this is actually something i think about a lot because i i spend a lot of time sort of thinking compare and contrast the u.s system versus the canadian system it's something i'm very interested in i think it matters less the number of parties than just how the parties are structured right so american political parties are really like no other party anywhere else in the world like they're and that's why when people are like oh we've only got two parties like it's just such a disingenuous argument because american political parties wait, like, wait for americans or canadians it's for americans yeah, to okay say. yeah yeah yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because it's like an american political party is not like a party in canada like in canada if i want to join the conservative party or the liberal party or whatever i have to like pay a fee i have to like renew my membership in the party every year i get my party card if the party leader doesn't like me if i say something really out there then i can get booted out of the party you know and again like and my ability to uh like my identity as a, as a member of the party is based on my loyalty to the party leader and my ability to sort of get in line and follow his agenda as he runs to be prime minister whereas in in america like a party uh identity is just something that you self-identify as like yeah. you can wake up tomorrow and be like i self-identify as a republican and then i self-identify as a democrat and then you register as this and then just your the mere act of self-identifying is what gives you a right to vote in party primaries right so you can do you have the same like in the united states i don't know how much you follow our yeah. the, the fights in congress but we yeah. have a brutal in party fighting yes, yes. such that our majority party they should never happen like can't have like a speaker of the house for some number yes. of weeks does, does, does stuff like that part, political party and fighting happen in canada no, or not at all and if it if it, there's even the smallest like hint of division in a party it's like this huge scandalous thing right mm -hmm. like it's big big news for there to be any divisiveness within a party like you know there the uh, the liberal party had some uh vote that they had in the in the parliament uh a few weeks ago about the israel palestine thing and you know it was like a emotion you know that did condemn both sides but you know there was one liberal mp a jewish guy from montreal who's been pretty pro-israel during his political career and he spoke out against it and he said i don't support this motion and this was considered like a huge 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 national news okay. that like even a single member of trudeau's party was not 100 percent aligned with a motion that the liberal party was in favor of so like that is that is something that is that is very different like if a, and, and and then the way that the press reports on this kind of thing is like mm, infighting in the liberal party is trudeau's hold on the position secure you know it's it's always sort of created in a very or it's always spun in this overly melodramatic way which is probably not healthy for democracy i think it's important that we allow the idea that parties can have division within them that people can debate but they can still be loyal and firm in their party identification right like the second you deviate from trudeau or Polyev or whoever, it should not be sign as, uh, interpreted as a sign that your loyalties to the party or your ideological identity is somehow fragile. Whereas I think the American system is much more healthy, particularly in, in regards to party primaries, like allowing folks that self-identify as supporters of the party to just hash out who they want their candidates to be. And then those candidates reflect a diverse, you know, in theory, they reflect a diverse um, constellation yeah. of perspectives of what it means to be a democrat or a republican you know a california democrat might be different than a democrat from mississippi right but they all get together in congress and they have to sort of like every vote in some ways in america is like a coalition vote you have to in theory cobble together a working majority actually johnson is doing this right now because he's begrudgingly having to pass some of these resolutions with the support of democrats just because he has this like crazy far right faction that won't vote for anything right yeah. and this is the thing with like the the ukraine aid and all this kind of stuff like he has to as all i think all good speakers of the house have to do they have to cobble together a workable majority which often entails sort of uh winning over some people on the other side uh -huh. whereas in canada it's just not that way at all it's just the party bosses and so you know in canada right now trudeau is in charge because he has the support of the ndp but when we say that he doesn't have the support of the NDP itself, he has the support of the NDP leader. Like it's an agreement between two men. And the understanding is, is that the parties are just kind of in line with whatever their boss tells them to do. So it's, it's much less democratic. Like that's the big takeaway is that Canadian politics is much, much more hierarchical. Yeah. I feel like it's very frustrating because people in the United States sometimes will blame a whole bunch of our problems on two party system. 
And then, yeah, I think you can point out, I was like, well, there is a pretty big diversity of candidates that exist within a particular party. Like you've got people um, that are all the way, you know, people in the Freedom Caucus for yes. conservatives, um, people like AOC yes. and um, like kind of like these more moderate Dems can exist in the same party. And yeah. not, not to say that the two party system is better or worse than anything else, but people, it's another thing where like Americans idealize something that Europe or Canada has in a way that, you know, pe people in the United States will say, I don't like that two senators in our Congress can completely and totally hold up, you know, every part of uh, any kind of legislation we ever want to pass. It's insane that we've got to appeal, uh, you know, to like a senator from West Virginia. That's unbelievable. And then I'll follow sometimes like in European politics where you're building coalition governments and there'll be a government where these people have like four seats in their parliament. Yes. But because you need that party to form the coalition, they're now dictating a ton of your party's platforms. Like theoretically, the same problems can crop up in a lot of different ways. And I think that um, do you want to say something about that? Yeah. Well, I was just and I think as well, like, you know, in in a lot of these parliamentary governments, like the prime minister, you know, the head of the executive branch is often like the head of a party that won like four percent of the vote. And, mm -hmm. you know, that job is not something that the voters even have direct control over. It's like something that like, the, you know, these party bosses negotiate. You know, a, a lot of the recent Italian prime ministers have just been like randos who have just been brought in to politics completely from the outside because like the political sort of elites are having a conversation like who who would we support as prime minister? And, you know, and I feel like you know, that that's not a healthy way to run a democracy. I think it's very important that voters have some de degree of direct control over the person that's making the most sort of senior uh, executive decisions in the government. But, you know, I get very, I get sort of like nostalgic. There was a time when sort of like Americans, like after World War II, like sort of mid-century American liberalism, I think has a lot going for it. And one of the things was like, there was a kind of like pride like that people would defend American institutions when foreigners would make arguments like haughty, arrogant arguments. Oh, you silly, unsophisticated Americans. Our system is so much better. And in sort of like mid-century American liberals would be like, no, our system is better. Our constitution is the best in the world. Right. And I mean, obviously that could get chauvinistic and simple minded. But these days, any foreigner, I feel, can just make any like can shit on America in any way. And there's just so many people like, oh, so true. We suck so much. You people are so bright and so enlightened. And like everything that foreigners have done is a million times better than our shitty system. Yeah, that's so cringe. I do agree <laughs> to not not to get too far into that. Yeah. Uh, but I, like even even when it comes to like the very abstract comments of uh, like when I'm arguing with socialists online and they'll say things, say things like, oh, well, actually, liberalism always gives way to fascism. And, you know, you guys are going to blah, blah, blah. And it's like, OK, well, who? Who beat the Nazis in World War II? Okay, <laughs> it wasn't the socialists. Okay, yeah, so I don't know why you would even like. Yeah, the, the uh, this unwillingness to give any credit it, it circles back onto that. Um, I, I think that I do, especially learning more about them now, because um, I'm embarrassingly uninformed on, on a lot of American structure in terms of how government everything works. And now learning more about it, I have a much much greater appreciation for how a lot of it works. Um, one thing that I think people make a big mistake about, at least in the United States system, is this idea that like we only have two parties, our government is broken, and that's why nothing is getting mm -hmm. passed. That's why nothing is working in the country. And sometimes when I look at things and people say something is broken, I, I have to play this game now where I'm trying to, in this like emotivist lens, I'm trying to interpret what people are saying because very rarely is it what they're actually saying. And when people say that like the system is broken, what they're really saying is the stuff that I want to happen isn't happening. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm trying to think, okay, well, you, stuff that you want to happen isn't happening, but what's going on? Is the system failing to express, you know, the actual desires of the constituents of, you know, whatever the politicians are? And I think the American system actually works really well, but I think the issue is it is accurately representing that we are historically divided yes. into completely different realities. And it's a pretty even split, yes. despite the however many more million votes a Democrat president might get than a Republican or whatever, or houses or, go or governor races. Um, that we have a big problem getting along right now. And sometimes people, I think, want to look to the system. Well, if we just had a multi-party system, yes. we would fix everything. It's like, no, half the people in this country think the election was being stolen. There's yes. no system that's going to fix yes, that. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Now, the George Will had a good line. You know George Will, the great... Do uh, you know George Will? Uh, of course, he was great. <laughs> uh, but the <laughs> audience doesn't. Explain who that is. Should, yeah, George Will. George Will is, is, is really, I think, one of the great conservative intellectuals of, uh, of American history. He no longer identifies with the Republican Party. But he was one of many who sort of ditched after Trump. But he, he, I think a lot of his, he was a columnist for the Washington Post. He still is okay. uh, for many, many years, many decades. But anyway, he has a good line where, you know, someone says, like, America's is divided. And he says, yes, but not frivolously which is, I think, a very important concession, right? Because we do often treat, like, the division... Something as, should just go away. Yeah, just, yeah, but it's like, it's not a frivolous division. Like, people are legitimately divided 
on substantial disagreements, yeah. right? And we can say like maybe some of those disagreements are based on dopey premises or falsehoods or whatever, but nevertheless, they exist. And yeah, I think that that's exactly true. What you say is that the American system, if it's polarized, if it's gridlocked or whatever, that just reflects a society in a state of gridlock. And mm -hmm. that's to me, like when your government accurately reflects divisions in your society, that means that you have a functioning democratic government. And I think that actually one of the problems with the Canadian system of government, which is less democratic than America's, is that I think it often creates a false impression of consensus where consensus doesn't actually exist. And I think that in the long term, that can actually be a recipe for a different sort of populism. And I think that's sort of what you're seeing in, in some countries in Europe where there's a kind of like phony imposed top down consensus from an undemocratic political elite that then ultimately gets upended in the form of like radical outsider parties, because that's the only sort of outlet that the, uh, you know, that the voters have. Yeah. I, um, it, it feels like a dumb position and I would have hated myself for saying this like five years ago, but you mentioned like political party leaders are supposed to be able to bring together people to vote on things. Um, it feels really cucked to say, but I really do feel like bipartisanship like in and of itself, irrespective of those, is, is a virtue to be had that being able to work with people yeah. that have real political disagreements, yes. not like, well, I totally disagree with this guy. He thinks that minimum wage should be 25 an hour and I think it be, should be 35 an hour, but you know, we managed to coexist that yeah. you should be able to take people that have substantively dis different uh, yeah. positions and you and work with them. And that, that scene increasingly, I think is like, backstabbing or being a turncoat or, or not being or, loyal or, or faithful or, or like as as like sort of the tucker carlson's of the world would say it's like a symptom of like the mono party like the the elite who who don't actually care about anything and they're just running everything for their own interests and all of these disagreements are just what do they the wrestlers call it like the kayfabe or whatever like the kind of like the manufactured sort of like conflict for show that just masks their real you know, yeah. sinister agenda. Yeah, right? like these guys are wheeling and dealing on the floor. They don't care about the American people. It's like, well, how do you think legislation gets passed? Yeah, like you have yeah. to, like at the end of the day, this is, yeah, it has to happen. But yeah. people, I mean, a lot of people, and this is kind of scary. Like, it's just like a lot of people in, in politics today seem to just aspire to the rise of a strong man who will impose their will and crush their enemies, right? Which is the antithesis of democracy, right? Democracy is about wheeling and dealing and accepting that diversity of all sorts will be reflected through the political system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to get people to. Um, p there are certain virtues that people have that they say they have, but when you actually look into it, they don't at all. So, uh, like a really good one, for instance, is like forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like people will say things like, "I'm a forgiving person," and you might have like, "Oh, well, here's a wife who killed her husband because he was abusing her," and it's like, "Wow, I would forgive her for that," and it's like are you really forgiving her or do you just think that she didn't actually do anything wrong right yeah. like oh well this guy stole but like his family was starving like i would forgive him for that and yeah. it's like okay like do you but then it's like this guy's like a pedophile or rapist he should be raped and tortured for five thousand years in prison and it's like okay well that's interesting so as soon as a, a, a thing comes upon a person that you really don't like yes. now that that principle of that value is completely thrown out the window yes. and yeah sometimes it feels like there are people that have very strong positions i think freedom of speech is a big one of these yes. where it felt like growing up in the 90s early 2000s that conservatives had a little bit more control of like the cultural levers a bit more than they do now at least mm -hmm. in terms of how the far left went and man gay stuff or like violence in video games and stuff like i feel like conservatives railed against us all the time but now that the left has way more control over the cultural output in mm -hmm. the united states every conservative is suddenly the most free speech proponent and advocate in the world yes. and i feel like just because right now it's because you can benefit on it yes. but then when trump yes. says things like i think i want to suspend the constitution to look for, for voter fraud yes. or i think we should be able to sue the media companies because they're the enemy of the people well that's also okay and it's like what yeah yes. no it's it's is no it's yeah it's exactly true <laughs> and that's but i mean like and that's the that's a sign that we just don't live in a political culture that actually values principle anymore. It is just about the, the pursuit of power. Yeah. Um, what you were involved in actual Canadian stuff, actual yes. real life politics stuff. Yes. We watched you fighting over, um, I think in Canada, they were going to pass some bill that would have made it. So what political YouTube channels be regulated is like pass it. Bill C-11. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's, I, what's that about you're asking? Yeah. Uh, well, no, I'm, well, there's two questions. Yeah. One is, that was an issue that was politically related that you decided to get personally involved yes, in, yes. like on an active level. Yes. Um, yeah. And then two, I guess, what has the follow up been from that? Yeah. So that it was. Um, so, okay, this is like a lot. <laughs> um, 
the Canadian media is regulated. The Canadian traditional Canadian media, like television and radio, is under the jurisdiction of a Canadian media regulatory body, the CRTC, the Canadian Radio and Telecommunications Commission. And part of the regulation that exists for radio and TV in Canada is to mandate that the Canadian networks have to broadcast a certain fixed amount of good Canadian content. This is like a nationalistic initiative. Because again, there's this deep insecurity in Canada that if we consume too much American media, then that will sort of culturally colonize us. And, you know, in practice, I think this just winds up being a kind of like backdoor subsidy for a lot of mediocre Canadian media content that can't contribute or compete in a free market. Mm -hmm. But anyway, like historically, the Internet was outside of this. The Internet was not regulated by that same media body. And in fact, there had been a bipartisan consensus in Canada that it was good that we had the news is divided that the Internet, you know, could just be as it is in America and just, you know, the kind of content you see is what you choose to see and algorithms and all the rest of it just do what they're going to do. And it's all based on in theory, it's based on what a user wants to see is what he winds up seeing. But then Trudeau's government, I suppose, got it in their head at some point that this was, in fact, bad and that we needed to bring the Internet under the same kind of like nationalistic uh, sort of regime in which uh, streaming services like YouTube, but Netflix and Disney Plus and all the rest of it would emphasize the showing of good patriotic Canadian content at the expense of bad foreign content, which would not be in the national interest to see. And this legislation did pass. And I can't speak to how it has been, uh, what the consequences have been in terms of implementation, because the implementation process is still ongoing. Okay. They're still having hearings and stuff about this. But when it was still at the political level, now it's at sort of like the bureaucratic implementation level. When it was at the political level, I did. I got involved because I feared this. Like, I feel like the way that uh, Canadian television and radio has been regulated has been very negative, has prevented Canadians from being able to freely consume the kind of media content that they want to watch in favor of stuff that indirectly the government thinks is better for them to watch. And I just kind of feel like that's not appropriate in a free society. And uh, I also think, you know, I again, I have a vested interest in this as well as somebody that makes content on YouTube. And as someone who has a lot of friends that make their livelihood making content on YouTube, I don't want YouTube to have to dance to some sort of government tune in a way that could punish my own content and my own ability to get my content seen by the sort of people I want it to be seen by because some government regulatory body has decided that my content is not in the national interest or does not meet the standards of what is good Canadian content that more Canadian viewers need to see. So yeah, I testified at the House of Commons. And then I testified at the Senate, the two bodies of our of our parliament. And then I testified at the, the CRTC itself, the regulatory body. And then I testified a, a second time uh, just a few weeks ago. And there's probably going to be more testimony because the only thing is that this stuff is moving at such a snail's pace that there's and it has the legislation has been very controversial. Right. I like to think that maybe I played some small role in that, that I helped uh, sort of raise awareness of this legislation and what it was aspiring to do and why that was something that Canadians who value a free internet should be worried about. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting that one of the main reasons why I oppose it is because of its sort of like nationalistic kind of character. Like it's not really a free speech issue per se. It kind of is in the sense that like being able to consume the kind of media you want is I think an exercise of a certain type of freedom as it relates to media. But a lot of it is just like, I just really dislike the idea of the government dictating to me or any other Canadian, like what kind of cultural content, what kind of media, what kind of like just videos, comedy videos, political videos, uh, cooking videos, like what kind of that kind of stuff is in the national interest to watch based on some sort of nationalism test. And this is something that would never happen in America. So in that sense, it's like it's, it's quite an exotic kind of Canadian issue that I can understand why Americans might sometimes kind of like struggle a bit to wrap their brains around. But that's also an illustration of how there are political issues in Canada that are very distinct and are very much a product of a kind of nationalistic, patriotic, progressive faction. Uh -huh. I don't think I think it seems really distinct, but I think I bet America has a lot of similar stuff. It just manifests in a different way. 
like I don't think as Americans we would never really think about this topic in the way that you do because we are like the loudest fucking yeah. culture. Um, but I think that this comes up in another way when we talk about like immigration in the U.S. Yeah. Where we're like, well, if we take on too many of these people, we need a national language because we mm. don't want them speaking Spanish. Um, we need to do something to control how many are coming in and bringing their values. That there is some kind of some weird uh, uh, nebulous concept of what an American identity is. And they try to, people in the US try to protect that to some extent. Mm. It just doesn't come out maybe the same way that it does in Canada. But I'm sure like if there were like 10 million uh, Mexicans or Chinese people that came to the United States and started making that type of media in the US that people might have a problem with it. Um, as an example, people go through certain towns and like there's a lot of billboards in Spanish or something. People will get really upset yes. about that. Um, Maybe it's, it's not necessarily the same type of problem, but I think it's similar-ish. I feel like, you no, know, I think you're not wrong in the sense that I feel like that sentiment exists in, mm -hmm. American, in American society. Whenever I come to America, though, it's always just striking how diverse this country is, how diverse its big cities are, how there are just people of all different nationalities speaking all different languages, with signs and all sorts of different languages and stuff. And it's just that that has never re really sort of manifest at the political level per se. But I think that's also because the constitution of America just prevents a lot of that kind of stuff. Like there are just so many barriers to the kind of regulation that would be used to kind of clamp down on that kind of stuff that could never be done in this country. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas it can be done in Canada because you can make unconstitutional laws like, you know, the government of, of Quebec, you know, another thing that I'm notorious for having uh, strong opinions on, right? Like the government of Quebec, you know, Canada's second biggest province, which has a French Canadian majority, like it is obsessed with protecting its sort of like cultural integrity and its cultural purity in a way that in America, I think would be perceived as being like very like racist and chauvinistic and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the government of Quebec is able to pass laws that say you have to have signs in French and all this kind of stuff, because in Canada, you can pass laws that violate freedom of expression and the Quebec government often does. So it plays out in a very different way. Mm -hmm. That's just again, like this is what a, a bigger part of my larger thesis, right, which is that it's the institutions that dictate the different outcomes, not something inherent about the culture. You could imagine that maybe even say in this state in Florida, like if, if you could elect a sort of right wing government that was un, uh, unrestrained by the First Amendment, maybe they would pass laws that say you have to have English only on the signs at the taco restaurant or whatever. And, you know, this sort of thing. Yeah, I, I agree that um, broadly speaking, people don't give anywhere near enough credit to the. I'd say the institutions, the constitutional guardrails, I guess, that exist on what can and can't be done. Yes. Um, I'm going to give you a big chunk of stuff okay it's gonna right. wrap a lot of stuff that we've talked it's, about together and it's gonna incorporate other stuff okay, okay ready okay I, I, you're 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 very uh very intense Stephen, and you talk very fast so I'm i have not, to i'm not talking that fast. i have to i have to work hard to, to keep you're up with good. you you've kept up with everything okay. okay i feel like humans as they exist as they have existed historically so for hundreds of thousands of years i think homo sapiens we evolved like certain drives that in the modern world don't really work that well. Mm. For instance, coming across stuff that was a high content of simple sugars mm. was pretty rare in the past. So if we saw it, it was very yummy. You eat it instantly. Yeah. And in the past, that's really good. But if you throw a kid in a gas station now with an unlimited budget, he's going to be, you know, BMI of 50 by the time yeah. he's nine years old. So this drive gets hijacked because we don't have these guardrails built into our brains evolutionarily to protect mm. from things that from from these types of like poisons i guess if you could say in, in modern society um one thing that you're talking about a lot right now relating to uh like this bill ca passing in canada yes. um to, to control the types of content and your 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 desire to have this democratization of content and people should be able to choose that, that what yes. they want <clears throat> one thing that i wonder is uh this is going to make me sound very authoritarian okay it is are people able to make good choices left to their own devices? And I think we would both agree to some extent the answer is no. Mm. But what do the guardrails look like to keep people from making bad choices? And something that I'm drawing here is you did a video on Wikipedia. Yes. And obviously I use Wikipedia a ton of my streams. Yes. So people think we're going to have this like huge fight or <laughs> disagreement over it. Um, but I've listened to that and I, I basically 100% agree. And I think that it's incredibly problematic that today 
um, when we were growing up, yeah, there were like a ton of websites. Now I would take issue with your video and say most of those websites were fucking horrible, okay. but there was a wide variety yes. of and stuff on the internet. You could look at so many different websites, so many different places of information. Yes. Whereas today you've got Google, which is basically Google is like your connector to Wikipedia, yes. Reddit, and then like three social media platforms. Yes. That's all Google is used for. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> now we can be critical of places like Wikipedia, or social media. Um, but I wonder given people's democratic choices to browse information do we always wind up in a world where it's all congealed in a few easy to access places where everybody's going to mcdonald's instead of yeah. enjoying whatever foreign cuisine that could enrich yeah. their lives more how do you dictate like this is illegal you're not allowed to do this anymore yes. versus people can make their own choices and maybe everybody just makes the worst choices ever yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's that's a big, important question, and it's a very difficult question to answer, you know, and earlier I talked about how sometimes something that turns you off your own political opinions is when you see those political opinions attempting to be expressed through public policy, right? In this yeah, I would say, com comparatively speaking, everybody going to Wikipedia, like make your own shit, could arguably be comparable, not the same, but comparable to the Canadian government. Be like, everybody wants to talk about America. Can we talk about our shit? Right. Yeah. It's kind of like the same vein of thought almost. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Right. Or, and so as a result, you have sort of a heavy handed government trying to steer people towards what they believe to be better. And that seems to be like the only solution, but I feel like that's a terrible solution as well. So it is. I guess at the end of the day, like you have to, like, hmm, I guess you, you have to err on the side of freedom and that you have to have some degree of faith that even when people overindulge or consume things that are bad for them, some sort of corrective mechanism emerges from that same democratic culture, right? So it's true. It's like, you know, Americans eat a lot of very unhealthy, bad food, but there is also sort of like a robust, uh, you know, diet and exercise economy in America that exists to provide people with alternatives to that. You know, people can maybe not enough people are taking that alternative, but it definitely exists and it is definitely supported by a large number of people as well. And I mean, I guess this is sort of like the argument in favor of, of like capitalism as opposed to government control. Like you believe that in a free market economy, it will be perceptive to people's needs and wants and desires. And that when people are consuming things that are bad for them, people have the ability to, at some point, wake up and notice that and desire an alternative and that a free market economy has the capacity to sort of fulfill those desires. But again, like, you know, the harder thing is, is that always just going to be like a small minority of people who realize the, the, their problematic consumption habits and crave an alternative? Or will the majority always sort of just want whatever is quick and easy and most dopaminergic and most satisfying? And yeah, like with my Wikipedia argument, that was kind of like the case that I made. Like, I'm very aware that like I've lost that argument, right? Like Wikipedia is not going away. It is still the dominant presence on the internet because all things considered, most people would just like something that's quick and easy and seems to, you know, satisfy their desires in the moment and don't really want to do the extra work that in it entails to come up with an alternative. But I guess the, the best defense you can say is that maybe, maybe the people that are trying to pr provide the alternative need to try harder. One of the things that I was going to say that it took me a long time to learn this, it's very frustrating, is I think that people assume that if a thing is good, mm. that that's enough. Yeah, that yeah. if this particular thing is good, then it will prevail over everything else. Yeah. And for a long time politically, I feel like on the left... That was a feeling of our political beliefs that like, well, clearly we're correct. It's just really hard to explain why, but you should like believe us because it's like way better than these guys who are crazy. Yes. And I feel like when you look at the left and you've got like the NPRs of the world or the PBSs of the world, and then you look at the right and you've got like Alex Jones, you've yes. got Bill O'Reilly, you've got like all these other people. The left's gotten better. We had Jon Stewart. Now we've got like... um uh, John Oliver, um, and kind of more entertaining people, but the right was so good at packaging and presenting their stuff. I feel like in a broader sense, academics, people in science, everybody needs to do better at 
presenting their stuff mm. rather than assuming that it's just too complicated to understand or people just don't like it because of what it is. Yes. And instead say, well, you know, you have a good idea, a good concept, but you actually need to do work marketing it because yeah. it being good in and of itself isn't a reason for somebody to consume it. It's got to be like really accessible and yes. everything too. Yes, yes. And when I think of like Wikipedia and stuff, the nice thing about Wikipedia is that like, yeah, you can go to the website type of thing and, and you yeah. have it instantly as opposed to having to do like, man, especially now when I'm reading like papers and stuff, it's like, okay, do, is it on just store? Maybe, maybe not. I got to go to this like Russian site, this sci hub, and I've got to see which like mirror is up right now so I can open it. Yeah. And there's like all this bullshit, even when pirating existed. When I was poor, I pirated because I can't afford anything. And then when I got wealthy, I still pirated for a long time because the pirating sites were so much better organized. Um, if you were on Oink's Pink Palace a long time ago or what, or any of these other torrenting sites that popped up for like music and stuff, the organization, the tagging, the categories, the form, it was, it was like a better experience. Mm. Even if it was pirates, like I would pay for this. I paid 60 bucks a month to, to yes. have this subscription. But the people on the legal side was like, well, our stuff is legal, so you should consume it. Yes, so yes, fuck yes, you. Yes, yeah. Yes. I wish people would would recognize that like as much as earlier we were talking about how it's sad that these things have turned into purely anesthetic the aesthetic value of something or the rhetorical presentation of thing is equally as important if not more so sometimes than the concept itself because without that connection it's like activism without voting it doesn't matter because nobody's going to actually engage with what you're doing because you haven't made it digestible or presentable to the average person no I, I i agree and this is what i mean when i sort of say like as much as it seems like a somewhat defeatist position but I think that the case for trying harder is a useful one. That is a useful thing for people to hear and for people to be motivated by. An example that I would give, you know, I haven't eaten meat in quite a long time. I've been vegetarian for over a decade. And I remember there was a time when like a veggie burger was like the shittiest burger you could ever have. Like it was like some crumbly patty made of quinoa and like corn nuggets or something. And it was disgusting. Mm -hmm. And people were not irrational for not wanting to eat that and to say, I don't want to be a vegetarian because this is the kind of shit I'll have to eat. But now, you know, you've got Beyond Meat and these impossible patties and all this kind of like cool dynamic stuff that's being created by the alternative to meat scene. And uh, the vegetarian industrial complex and whatever. And it's, it's good. Like it's so much more, uh, delicious to eat. It tastes much more like the meat. It doesn't make you feel like you're missing as much. And it's all marketing. Like it's all just based on, on, it's like being receptive to why people do not like the alternative. And again, like not just posturing righteously that you should like this because it's better for you. I think that actually, and I could even bring this to the Canadian thing, right? So it's like, Lots of Canadian media has been very successful. There are lots of Canadian television shows, Canadian musicians, and all sorts of stuff that's been enormously popular, not just in Canada, but around the world. And there is also a lot of Canadian content that has not been popular, and this is the stuff that now wants the laws to be bent in a way that will give them the success that, they, that these artists assume that they deserve. When really, you just kind of have to think, well, like, maybe your product just wasn't that great. Uh -huh. Maybe the fact that it's not appealing to Canadians is not some sort of reflection of the degree that we've been colonized by the evil imperialist Americans. Maybe you're just not trying very hard. And then, like, you know, the Justin Biebers of the world or whatever are just offering a better product and have uh -huh. better marketing and all this kind of stuff. Not, uh, um, yeah, I don't know how often you hear people say this, but, like, I'll talk to, usually happens on the conservative side. Sometimes it's happens on the far left side, too. But people will start complaining, like, oh, yeah, there's a guy at Google that's, like, turning our channel oh, yeah, down. Yeah. There's a guy at Google that's, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah fucking with it and it's like and then you like open the channel and it's like okay well we've got videos from five minutes of length to three hours in length we've got like no consistent posting scheme we've got so i don't even know like maybe there is somebody at google turning the thing down but there are so many other things that you should be doing differently like yes. there's probably not a guy that's just out to get your channel probably oh, yeah. not happening yes, yes. yeah um you mentioned earlier the uh off camera about moving to america mm. Is this something you've like publicly considered or is this something that you've ever spoken about before? Like, what would that even look like? That's un inconceivable as an American to me to move to another country <laughs> and well, leave my my eagle bearing patriotic 50 yeah. star spangled banner. Yeah, people, people, I find Americans that move to other countries like uh, kind of turn off, you know, like I've uh, sometimes you'll meet like a Canadian or an American who moved to Canada. And those people always kind of like weird me out a little bit. It's like, you know, really? Like you had to leave the U.S.? I mean, and I feel the same way about Canada, right? Like, I, I love Canada. I've had a very great life in Canada. Like, I, in no sense do I, like, want to flee Canada. I would like the experience of living in America. I think that would be very valuable for me as someone who cares very deeply about these two countries and a desire to bring them closer together. I think I'm very jealous of Canadians who have even lived in America for a few years and had just that experience of sort of, like, deepening their understanding and appreciation. The problem with uh, this continent 
is that we don't have easy migration, which just makes no sense at all to me. Like if I was ever prime minister, that would be like priority number one is creating some sort of like free movement of goods and people across the 49th parallel. It is insane to me that France and Germany, two countries that have like twice fought horrible wars against each other in the 20th century, have an easier time like moving between uh, each other than we, Canada and America, like the two most peaceful, similar allied nations in the entire world have. And so anyway, this is just a long way of saying that as much as I might like to have the experience of living in America for an extended period of time, it's just very difficult to do legally. Right. Like I would have to apply for a celebrity visa, which I've looked into. That's probably the kind of visa I am most uh, likely to get because I'm famous enough to at least make the case that I could qualify. But it's like it's a very complex ordeal. You know, you have to get a bunch of letters of endorsement. You know, you have to like provide a very detailed itinerary of everything you're going to do for like the next three years or however long you want your visa to last. It's it's complex. And I've looked into it. It's it's it is complicated and intimidating and. I'm somebody that doesn't have a great mind for these complex bureaucratic processes and stuff. And I worry about getting rejected. I worry that my case for myself isn't strong enough. You, I'm get, just curious. You've never heard of a guy online called Moist Critical, have you? Yeah, I, I know of him. Oh, very famous. Uh, what would you call him? I guess like gamer, YouTuber guy or whatever. But he, I, just yesterday we were watching a video where he's sponsoring a team for Apex Legends of a bunch of Australian players. Oh, yeah. And they like couldn't get through the fucking visa process yeah. to just get these players to come to the U.S. and play like a, a, like a multi-billion dollar tournament. Oh, I mean, like, <laughs> like I mean, Jesus it's, it's arguable that like I might be breaking a crime even doing this podcast with you, right? Yeah. Because like I might this might qualify as like I'm working illegally in the U.S. right now. It's it's quite preposterous, right? Like, I mean, Canadians do break these laws all the time. Like Canadians come across the border and work and live in America for years where they can obviously blend in and be undetected. Blend but in. Yeah, there's Canadians among us. Yeah, there okay. are. You never know, <laughs> Stephen, they could be in this building right now. But uh, <clears throat> no, it's 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 dumb. And it like this is another thing that like I really am pissed at Trudeau for because like Trudeau had an opportunity to negotiate this when he was negotiating NAFTA with Trump, like mm -hmm. Trump tore up NAFTA, which to me like, I know that Trump was doing it for his own reasons in the context of American politics. But for me, that was a real opportunity for Canada because Canada has to get more access to the U.S. market on every level, both in terms of like a greater ability to sell our goods across the border and an ability for Canadians to live and work in the U.S. Because we know that that has always been a huge source of, of prosperity for Canada. Right. Like Canadians contribute. Canadians are great people. We're very intelligent. We have a lot to give. The fact is, is that a lot of the big centers of, of economic dynamism are in the U.S. You know, there is no Silicon Valley in Canada and there never will be. And it's a fool's errand to try to invent one. You know, there's no Hollywood in Canada. There never will be. You know, there's no Wall Street. Having access, though, is nice even for your own country. It's funny because the example that you gave earlier, I don't know if you did this in Tesh or not, when you mentioned Justin Bieber, Canadian, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. So, yeah. Right? so like we both mutually uh, benefit from having a free movement of people and uh, and goods. And yeah, Trudeau just did not take advantage to get any sort of advancement in that. I think that Trump would have gone for it because I think Trump only conceptualizes NAFTA as like some Mexico thing. I mean, this is this is another sort of like somewhat idiosyncratic opinion I have, which is I think that like NAFTA has been bad for Canada in the sense in just in, in that it ties our economic interests to Mexico's relationship with the U.S. And I think that uh, you know, the Mexico US relationship is a whole complex bag of, of worms or whatever, mixed metaphors. Mm -hmm. But the Canada US relationship I, should be a should, lot better. It should be a lot better and it shouldn't be dependent on the state of Mexico American relations, right? But Trudeau did not have any interest in sort of broadening. Maybe it was because like everything that Canada gets, Mexico would have to get. And obviously there'd be zero desire to let Mexicans have free movement and, uh, and, and settlement in, in America, like the political will for that would never exist. But yeah. the there's also probably a bit of the Trump at the time. It's hard even to imagine because everything is like now we're used to it. But at the time, I think Trump was still seen as such an insane figure that the idea of like trying to negotiate something more bilateral or cutting Mexican out like Mexico out of that deal probably would have been a whole bunch of political blowback yeah. from all sorts of different sides for that as well. Yeah. yeah, it's true. But, you know, I think a good leader who has a sense of Canada's national interest has to think about the interests of Canada first and not think about the interests of, uh, you know, the American political conversation or Mexico's political interests or whatever else. Like, I wish we had a leader who would fight for our interests in that way. But the problem is that Canadians aren't even encouraged to conceptualize their interests in that way. Like, Canadians are told for sort of patriotic nationalistic reasons, 
I mean, and some Canadians like sincerely believe this, which seems insane to me that like Canada's destiny and like a strong, good Canada is a Canada that like goes it alone, that has less to do with America, that it trades less with America and this kind of stuff, which is just these ideas of like, um, what is, I think it's called an autarky, an autarky right? Yeah. yeah. Or what do they call so, it in North Korea? Like Juche, like complete independent self sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can sort of see how that sort of nationalistic impulse would have some overlap with a certain faction of the left in 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 canada mm -hmm. um do you ever worry as your opinions change i think about this a lot because i fashion myself to be a hyper logical beacon of rationality region of course uh, and reason do you ever worry as you get older that really everything you heard growing up was true that as a young man you're just gonna have crazy beliefs regardless of what you think and as you get older they're gonna mellow out no matter what and you're like yeah. fuck maybe they have and then sometimes you see other, especially because I'm in the debate sphere, like I'll see other guys and there'll be people like Sneeko or whatever else. And I'll look yeah. at him. It's like, you're, you're like a 22 year old man. And I totally get it. It yeah. feels very condescending. It feels very stupid. And then it feels very dumb, at least to think of myself, like, fuck, am I just mellowing out a lot of shit just because I happen to be getting old? It feels so stupid. Do you ever think about that in terms oh, of yeah. growth or? I think about that a lot. And I think it's very obviously happening with me. Like I was much more sort of sure of myself and much more. <clears throat> excuse me, ideological when I was young in a way that makes me sort of cringe now. Whereas I do feel like, you know, the fundamental problems are complicated and that they don't have easy answers. If they mm -hmm. had easy answers, we would have solved all the problems a long time ago. Yeah. But the reason why these easy answers aren't being pursued is not because we have some sort of nefarious elite who are just hate you know, their fellow man and are trying to ruin society for its own sake or because they're getting their pockets lined or whatever. It's because a lot of those ideas don't work. And uh, so I feel like as you get older, you can't help but just kind of feel like the best we can aspire to is to just kind of like muddle through, get small wins here mm -hmm. and there. Yeah, that is a slog fest. It it's is not a like a, yeah. yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's not a dash. It's a marathon, as they say. But it's it's the other thing true. Uh, the other thing that you said rings true to me as well, because I do like uh, forming relationships with with younger people people in their 20s and stuff. I like doing mentoring and mentorships and that kind of stuff. That's very meaningful to me. I think it's something that more older people should do as well. But as satisfying as it is, I do sometimes feel like it's hard to get the right disposition towards it because my inclination is sometimes to be a little bit condescending, I think, and to not fully appreciate the degree in which being somewhat cringe as a young person, being overly confident, being overly ideological, being a bit of a kind of like self-righteous know-it-all, like that might be an important part of the learning process. There are two things that I go over a lot on stream is that one, when we're reviewing like uh, docs that like young kids are writing where they're trying to like me to each other at like 16 yeah, yeah. and I'm like, uh, one thing I try to remind my audience of this is like, okay, listen, this is really cringe and this guy's acting like it's the most important thing in the world, but this guy is 16 years old. This probably is the biggest thing that's ever happened in his life. Like this guy's yes. breakup or this person's like bad experience. This is probably the most dramatic thing that's mm -hmm. happened in their 18 years or 17 years of existence. That's worth like keeping in mind. Um, and then a second thing is, especially when talking to conservatives, but, but even when talking to the left, people will talk about the radicalization of college kids. They're super radical and blah, blah, blah. And in my mind, I'm like, you should be. 18 to 22, yeah. this is the time in your life everybody is fucking crazy when you're a kid. And you should be. The only problem is that social media has given you ways to immortalize that mm. or ways to make you feel more important than you should. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a big problem, that rather than college being this kind of safe place to be crazy and wild and radical and make your communist and your Nazi whatever yes. student unions yes. and all the crazy shit you're doing, now it's... I'm actually 19 and I'm going to tell you, the rest of the world, how it should be run. Greta Thunberg is now the yes. representative and speaker for climate change, even though this person's never worked a job before, even like yes. back when they were popular, right? Yes. And um, yeah, that's, that's, it's problematic because one, people are like, why are college kids so radical? It's like, college kids are always radical. The Vietnam yes. demonstration, like, yes. this is always what college kids are. But then two, um, one of my, Another thesis, a big thing I have is there's a lot of, everybody has a lens for how they view the world. And conveniently that lens will usually explain every single problem in the world. Yes. So if you're a feminist, toxic masculinity is why Ukraine and Russia are fighting. Yes. And it's why, yes. yeah. But um, I feel like when people talk about their little things, you know, whether it's democracy and fascism, authoritarianism, feminism, blah, 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 there's this huge thing, which is like the internet and social media that's yes. changed everything in the world and nobody really wants to seriously grapple with that except for when it conveniently uh, intertwines with their particular 
thing. So like red pillars will say things like Tinder is destroyed like dating yes. markets. Sounds like Discord has probably destroyed because everybody's online now. Yeah. You 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 can <laughs> yeah, you're just you're just so much more exposed to everything. Like college was always like a very formative experience for people on both the right and the left. But it was ultimately something you left, right? Yeah. Like you were part of this weird little bubble subculture and then you left it, right? But now it's like in some ways it feels like you never leave the college campus because every generation of college student is constantly being bombarded into your eyeballs through mm -hmm. TikTok and social media and all the rest of it. So you're always like very hyper aware of what like young people are up to and what sort of like crazy radical kind of people are up to. And those groups have way more normative weight attached to them as well. If That's you're looking true. at somebody who's like 17, 18, 19 and they're like, uh, I'm protesting for... Yeah. Indonesia or like I'm a scene kid or goth kid or you know anti-establishment whatever blah 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 it's one thing but now when a person is like you know like well I'm a non-binary fighter against racism blah, blah blah it's like you'll get over it and it's yes. like excuse me <laughs> are you being transphobic and are you being whatever phobic and yes. now I'm going to destroy your fucking life as a 19 year old yes. it's like you don't even have a life yet how are you going to destroy mine mm. but like yeah you're right because it's, it's harder for them to move off of it and the positions I think because of the social media aspect have so much more validity to them way yeah. more than an 18 19 year old ever deserves to have yeah. Um, yeah that's insane but like what you said about like the normative importance I think is is a key point as well because I think in some ways like the culture has changed and I think that like some of the uh the college arguments have won the day like you were talking about before like with the the land acknowledgements and all of that kind of thing like there's stuff like that that has entered the mainstream in a way it hadn't before and that there was a sort of sense that like you act like a kind of radical and you entertain these kind of like extreme beliefs when you're in college but at some point you graduate into the real world and it's time to kind of get over that stuff and here's how things actually work and that kind of stuff but and so that that can be a little difficult too. like, I don't I don't go sort of on to the far right and where like, oh, the woke mob has run everything and, you know, this kind of stuff. But at the same time, like, it's important to sort of concede that there have been some gains and that society has been sort of collegeified, maybe because more people go to college as well. Mm -hmm. And also to. because not to blame everything on conservatives, because yeah. like the fault here, I think, is the left people have gotten crazy yeah. left, at least in, in far in so far as like um, like administrators and colleges and stuff yeah. have gone and some of the DEI stuff for sure. But I think as conservatives, for whatever their predisposition is to just like say this is all bought off, these institutions are all corrupt, that the stop to stop participating in them, I think has been incredibly damaging. Yeah. Like as much as you might not like a certain person's opinion, it's good to have them there as a grounding force. Yeah. And there is a tension that should exist. And in that tension, you find something better than what either side could produce on their own. Yes. And yeah, I feel like it's been very unfortunate that as conservatives have unplugged from more and more areas, um, I'm curious actually, I guess for you to be interested in art and that kind of stuff, I feel yeah. like you're stepping into environments that are exclusively incredibly far left, or does that yeah. not happen to you or? Yeah, I think so. And actually, that's been kind of interesting in, in terms of the uh, the Gaza thing in particular. You know, like I follow a lot of artists on on uh, on like Tumblr and Instagram and Pinterest and stuff like this. And it's been wild to see like these artists who just made like, you know, innocuous gen general art that I enjoyed. Now suddenly like every single second post is like, we will fight from the river to the sea yeah. and watermelons. And, you know, I've even seen like some of this like, you know, innocent like fan art accounts that I follow and are now like drawing like the Kingdom Hearts characters like waving the Palestine flag and stuff. <laughs> Jesus. It's it's there is definitely a, a cringe aspect of some of this stuff that uh, goes beyond what some of the left, even the right wingers sort of fixate on. Yeah. But, I think it kind of grounds back to what I was saying before. One of the reasons why I like debate and conversation is yeah. because to have that, it's forcing both people to at least be in the room with each other mm. to have some kind of conversation because once they become separated, my God both sides just get incredibly detached from any type of epistemic similarity. The realities are just completely yeah, yeah. different. It's they very get into frustrating. The, into the purity spiraling, right? Mm -hmm. Because l having lost like the a real ideological opponent, they just turn the guns inward and then they just define... It's a firing squad, like yeah. in a circle. Yeah. yeah. And then so, yeah, the left-wingers get more left and the right-wingers get more right because they're fighting each other rather than... Yeah. And because like um, the demand for opponents exceeds the supply. So then you have to start imagining that like somebody who's just like a slightly moderate like leftist is in fact actually like a crypto fascist or whatever. And then like, you know, somebody who's like a moderate Republican is actually like a woke far left, you know, whatever. So it's 
It's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of this has been contributed to by both sides, by people on the left calling everybody a Nazi, by people on the right being Nazis but lying about it. <laughs> there was a, um, by people on the right calling everybody socialist, by people on the left saying, oh, I'm a sock down. But in reality, they were fucking tanky. Yes. And it's just like this crazy world. ContraPoints had a line, you, I'm sure you're familiar with her. Yes. Uh, in one of her videos that I, I vibed with super hard, I thought it was really funny, where she saw an advertisement on Twitter and it was something along the lines of like, we need to take care of our future. And it was just like a white mother holding a white child yeah. and her mind immediately went to Nazi propaganda. Mm. And she was like, and she looked at it and said, well, it's, it's not anything like that at all. But like yes. her mind was so predisposed to seeing that because of like people accusing everybody of doing things and people hiding about what yes. they actually have. Yes. And like, yeah. And then we talked about earlier, I think this was off camera, but it was like, like I like to consider myself like relatively nonpartisan, relatively like reasonable, but like, the biggest red flag to me is anytime yes. you see a channel that's like, you know, Veritas, Logic, yes. Reason, Centrist. Not, these are always the most yes. partisan, hacky, fucking. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. You know, it's such a it's such a trigger. Yeah. When somebody because I feel like the same way, like I feel like these days I like to sort of say that, like, you know, my beliefs are kind of a mix and it's hard to put a label on me or whatever. But that's such a horrible triggering phrase as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's. We, should, we need to we need to need to reclaim some of that language, I think, because you can't you can't let your enemies own all the good terms, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And that's this is like something that uh, conservatives used to argue in their more sort of uh, intellectual days where they would always sort of say, like, we should claim the title of liberal. We shouldn't let the lefties have liberal. And, you know, because liberalism is a, is a when you actually look at it, it's a proud tradition that encompasses much of what we believe. But, mm -hmm. you know, that perhaps is asking too much these days for people to make those kind of arguments. Yeah. Do you, um, what do you feel about made? Made? We talk about that a lot down here. Uh, I'm sure you do. I mean, again, this is another classic example of Canada existing in the American consciousness, mostly as like a metaphor or a calibration point. I mean, I, and I do think that Canada's made policies are a calibration point. Like I, from what I understand, we do have one of the most extreme regimes as far as medical assisted death goes. Mm -hmm. The difficult thing, and like I'm not a big supporter of the regime that we have in Canada for the reasons that I'm sure you're well versed in, but the difficult thing is that in Canada, our Supreme Court has ruled that this is basically a constitutional right. And so it is difficult to come up with a made policy that is constitutional. And that's why sort of the Trudeau government has been sort of trying to, they've now actually, because basically the, the big fear in Canada now is that Everybody could just uh, get medically assisted dying for any minor mental health issue, right? And the Trudeau government has asked for an indefinite extension on that, or is asking for an indefinite, ex or not asking, but I should say, is going to take like an indefinite period of time to come up with legislation to do that, because they're so worried for the obvious reasons that this would be overused and too easily taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. But that delay it, unto itself is probably unconstitutional because the only reason why they're being forced to entertain the creation of a mental health uh, process at all is because the idea that excluding mentally ill people from employing this would be unconstitutional. Because if you're saying that there is a constitutional right to end your life on your own terms, which is what the Supreme Court of Canada has ru ruled. That's wild. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's crazy, too. I mean, it's even more insane because the Canadian Constitution says that every Canadian has a right to life. Like yeah. that is the language that they uses. And the Supreme Court has said that a right to life is meaningless unless you also have a right to control the circumstance in which your life ends. Right. To control the I think the exact language they use is like the passage into death is like bound up in the right to life to control the passage into death. And so once you have that as a constitutional right, it is hard to come up with a regime that is not discriminatory. Like if you say, well, OK, you can because this is what happened. Right. It's like initially the legislation that was passed in the aftermath of the Supreme Court ruling says that, OK, you have to have a terminal illness. You have to get like a bunch of doctors to sign off on it. They have to say there's no reasonable expectation of recovery, blah, 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 blah. But then in subsequent litigation, you know, people that want to uh, commit medically assisted dying have said, like, what right does the government have, have to, to infringe on yeah. our rights? You know, so. And that, that makes the conversation just very different than the conversation in America, because there has been no right to death. Right to death. That right? philosophical argument, I would have to read what I guess your court said in particular. I feel yeah. like that's very unconvincing. That's insane. That, well, well, if you have a right to life, you should be able to kill yourself uh, anytime you want as well. You should. You should. That would be a fun, a fun <laughs> destiny live stream. I'm sure reading the Supreme Court ruling. I think that our Supreme Court is not that great, if okay. I'm going to be honest. I think that the, uh, there's another difference, right? It's like, <clears throat> excuse me. The American Supreme Court, you can love them or hate them, but I think that they are very high caliber individuals that sit on that uh, court. 
you know, even somebody like Amy Coney Barrett, who's like seen as like this wild eyed lunatic. Like, I think that she, you know, is very credentialed, very experienced, probably a very good writer, persuasive arguer and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Canadian Supreme Court is just not like their arguments are a lot weaker. They often r do arguments that contradict other arguments. And because the Canadian Supreme Court isn't sort of uh, ideological in the way that the American Supreme Court is like in Canada, this is another sort of problem with like sort of the phony consensus. The Canadian Supreme Court tends to always rule unanimously on everything because it's seen as important for all the judges to get along. And I think that when you it's seen as important for all the judges yes. to get along. Yes. OK, that sounds it's... incredibly fucking horrible, but OK. Yeah, and I know, because then I mean, the argument that I've made is like, if OK, if that's the ruling mindset, then why bother having nine judges at all? Why not just have two or one? Yeah. Right. Like if, if consensus is the only thing that matters, there's no point of having multiple judges. But anyway, I think part of the way that this consensus manifests is that a lot of times you do kind of get rulings that read like that they were designed to appease a bunch of disparate opinions. So. But no, it's uh, do you believe that? No, I guess you don't accept that there is a right to die. Um, I feel like you can get that from some areas or like um, I would have to work on building the philosophical foundation for this. But like I can clearly accept that there are cases where I think it is that there are no arguments on the other side against it or mm -hmm. very few where um, if you are dealing with some sort of chronic pain that's yeah. reached a certain threshold that has no end in sight. Yes. I think it's totally fair that this person should have the ability to exit uh, their life. Yeah. So like the obvious cases are um, some sort of like on life support or on some sort of treatment, you know, you can live with a cancer for maybe eight to 12 more months, but it's going to be like on chemo the whole time. It's going to be painful. Yes. You're probably not going to live. I could totally think in those circumstances, the idea of saying a person can't kill themselves is insane. Mm. But um, absent those conditions, I think, I think there's an argument for, but at this stage of my life, I'm a little bit against that the total democratization of everything. Yes. I think there's an argument for more friction in life in general for things. And suicide, I think, is, should be a high friction event yeah. to where um, if you were to give everybody, you know, let's say everybody has the right to death and somebody tomorrow invents a technology where it's like, OK, well, here's a button on your yes. computer. And if you push it, you can just kill yourself painlessly yeah. and, you know, everything, you know, at, fuck at the end of sports games, we might lose a fifth of our population. <laughs> now, like, I don't know if it's good for everybody to have that choice, like yeah. because people, humans do take a, a sort of path of least re resistance, whether yeah. it's researching topics on Wikipedia or yes, a book. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, whether it's, um, yeah, choosing to kill yourself or figuring something out. Like if you make that process too easy, there's mm -hmm. a there's a concern there. And yeah, obviously, I'm I'm sure of this without doing any research at all. I hope it's the case that in Canada, the majority of your made things have to do with people with like at the end of their life, chronic illness, yeah. stuff like that. But obviously, the sensational stories are like the 24 year old attractive yeah. young woman decides that she wants to kill herself because she's had depression for six years. Yeah. Oof, that's like a really rough one. Yeah, yeah. No, there was there was some story that made a lot of headlines in the Canadian news the other day where it was like a guy in Quebec and he was like waiting in the hotel or not the hotel, the hospital waiting room for hours. And he developed like a horrible infected bed sore. Oh, the bed. Yeah. Yeah. And then that sort of made him, he was in so much pain that he wanted to kill himself over that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on this. I don't want to pretend like I know all the examples of this, but I, I do think that it has, it's still, despite the fact that the laws have gotten more kind of loose, I think that it is still mostly used in, in severe contexts. But the problem is that exactly what you sort of said, like the old cliche about suicide, is it being a permanent solution to a temporary problem? And I think a lot of people just don't have the capacity to understand the degree to which the misery that they experience in the present might be able to be alleviated through means other than a permanent fix. Mm -hmm. So there's the, um, did you say it was C11? Was that the name of yeah. the bill? So you've done stuff with Canadian politics. Your channel is largely built on politics. You've got a fan base that probably watches you for political stuff. Um, going forward, as you make more content, do you feel any type of obligation to your audience? Or do you feel like you carry a mandate from them to do political stuff? Do you feel bad, like trying to switch more to cultural stuff? Have you done videos where you're like, guys, I hate this. I want to do cultural stuff. Well, I, I, I haven't been that political. Like when I left my job as a TV talking head to start YouTube, mm -hmm. like I was literally working for a television station. And then one day the TV station just went out of business and I had to figure out something else to do. And that was when I decided to give this YouTube thing a try. I was already in my my 30s by that point. Um, and I specifically decided that I didn't want to do just what I did on TV on YouTube. I kind of wanted a break politically. And inevitably, though, people can kind of sense where your skills are and sense where your passions are. And as I when I would sort of do like lightly political stuff, it would really resonate with my audience. And they'd be like more political stuff, do more political stuff every time. 
that there'd be an election or like some sort of big Canadian news story, people would turn to me and expecting me to explain it to them and, and give me my <clears throat> offer my hot take on it. And that was a it's like a kind of mixed blessing because I like having a reputation as a guy that can speak openly and honestly about Canadian politics in a way that I think a lot of people cannot because they're too partisan or polarized or whatever. But on the other hand, like a lot of this stuff is upsetting and is not fun and I don't enjoy doing it and it contributes to a kind of toxic culture. And there's a lot of other topics that I think are as important, if not more important to teach the cultural literacy kind of stuff that people aren't doing, whereas there's so many people doing the political stuff. But and then there's the other problem, though, is that, um, you know, all of that being said, like the audience wants what it wants, you know. I can make videos that are important to me and that I think are important, but they don't get watched by as many people. And then there becomes like a market incentive. And I think that that is such an underrated aspect of the political commentary world that we all inhabit is the degree that market incentives drive people's behavior. Audience capture. I talk about it a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very frustrating when someone will say things like, I don't trust the mainstream media because uh, the big corporations pay for their, uh, you know, they, they yes. sign their paychecks. And it's like, okay, well, what if your favorite alternative media guy tomorrow says, you know what? Uh, I read the research and actually the CIA is a pretty good organization yes, yes. or I actually do trust the FDA. Like, where do you think their bread is buttered? No, exactly. um, yeah, I, was, I was watching some, I think that actually our, our old buddy Ben Shapiro is a classic example of this because like he understood Trump early on in a very clear way, <sighs> very clear eyed about it. I don't know if you brought this up during your debate with him, but it's like I was watching some clip of him on Instagram the other day where he was like making this argument that like, well, when you really think about it, Trump actually has a point that the election was rigged because blah, blah. I and mean, you know, like he's using his sort of lawyerly way to kind of when i had my conversation with him because i do yeah. think he's smart yeah man the pretzel that he was twisting himself into because i'm like how could you support trump just on like jan 6 election denial stuff yes. alone and he's like well um biden is actually the bigger threat because yeah. when trump tried to overthrow the republic which i agree he did and i agree he'll try to do it again what yeah. the guardrails held last time so the guardrails will probably hold next time whereas the stuff yes. that biden wants to pass actually the guardrails won't hold on that because it's legislation so yeah. even if trump tries to overthrow the republican yeah, yeah, yeah. you know up in the country and turn us into a fascist dictatorship i don't think he'll have much success so that's why yes. i would vote for him and i'm like what and it's like and it's like you you know that is that the conversation he's having like with Mrs. Shapiro when the cameras yeah. are turned off? It's like probably not. It's the same like like Tucker Carlson, right? I like, loved those texts. Those leaks, texts, right? Where it's like this is okay. So he is a real life thinking human being. Like yes. I hate this motherfucker. I can't yes. wait till he's gone because god damn do we look stupid defending him. Yes. Sydney Powell is fucking insane. Like get me yes. the fuck out of yeah. Essentially, yeah. No, it's it's true, right? But yeah, they as you said, they know what side their bread is buttered on, and they have to they have to keep. Their popularity because i mean in particular like in sort of the trump era and again like to give another shout out to my my bulwark buddies right like a lot of those people they not only like turned off of trump when he ro rose these never trump republicans they also were like driven out like they're the if they had jobs in in media or elsewhere like they saw that their numbers just tanked the more they criticized trump and so they start to realize i just don't have a opportunity here some Glenn of the back in the blaze the yeah, same shit happened yeah, yeah well i mean the uh the famous national review cover on never trump you know has all of these marquee names of conservative big shots and like half of them uh you know, got the pushback and then they converted. And it's like, uh, sorry, Baxi's, I don't actually believe that. Trump's great. <laughs> yeah. You still like me, right? You know, and that's that's kind of terrifying, right? Like the idea that honesty is not always rewarded and and sort of accuracy and all that. So, but I don't know. I feel like I'm I get a bit more of a pass of that just because like I'm talking about Canadian things and most people, even other Canadians, don't really have strong opinions on Canadian politics or aren't fluent enough. To kind of like understand it so when i talk passionately about canadian things or when i express a canadian opinion on something it kind of reads different it reads as almost like it's existing in a kind of like a political space like i'm just kind of like analyzing an issue but i guess um it's kind of a final question we've been yeah. going for about three hours right Jeez. okay um these are kind of one and the same if you could change the whole I guess like political or socio-political or cultural political landscape, mm -hmm. have everybody do like one thing differently, what would it be? And then like the second question is like, if anybody could take like one thing from your content, or if you could communicate one thing to people, what would it be? There's probably overlap. This could be the same answer for both. Oh, yeah, geez, I'm curious. Man, that's such a huge question, <laughs> mm -hmm. Stephen. I could change like one thing about 
the, yeah. the society. Or think of it through the lens of like, if people, if everybody watched your content, what's like one thing that you would want them to take from like your content in terms of how they navigate the world, politically, culturally, YouTube-ily, whatever. I, I think I would like people to be more grateful for the society that they inhabit. Because I think if people could find just more joy in the small things and allow themselves to have joy in the small things, I think that that would probably make people less inclined to find meaning elsewhere, including in toxic political subcultures, okay. you know? So, you know, I talk about just, you know, the, the sort of the culture of, of sort of middle-class America, including consumer culture, including like, you know, food and toys and all of these other sort of material things, technology and entertainment, pop culture, you know, all of this stuff that defines the rhythm of our daily life. And yet we largely take for granted and, and even sort of feel guilt and self-loathing about enjoying. And I, I feel like I want to kind of create a permission structure in which people can feel good about these kinds of things again, feel good about the abundant society that we live in and feel proud to be the inheritors of it. So that's probably something and yeah, and to be aware that it, it has a sort of a pedigree, like it, it, it comes from somewhere. And that history is also something that's worth being grateful for to again, yeah, to have inherited the end point, not end point, but to have inherited this particular point of a long story of social progress. I think that's something to be happy about, not miserable about. Um, and then the second thing you said, like, again, if I could change something, like, man, that's such a big, difficult question. I don't know. Is there like an obvious one that you have in your mind? If someone was asking you that question? No, I would, I would link it to the first thing. I think my answer would be pretty similar for both. Yeah. For you, I imagine if you could change something, it would just be for people to be a little bit more grateful yeah. or aware of like what's going well around yeah. them instead yeah. of every news article is like, yeah, this sucks. This is horrible. These are, it's never been as bad as it has been before, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And it's like, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd really like to get rid of conspiracy theories somehow. Sure. Like, I just feel like conspiracy theories are really at the root cause of a lot of bad developments in politics and a lot of bad trends in politics i feel like it's it's kind of like underrated the degree to which like the mainstreaming of conspiracy theories has just been such like we used to have like such strong antibodies in the democratic culture to fight against conspiracy theories and in some ways like that's the worst thing that i think trump has done yeah. is that you know through trump's rise now suddenly somebody like alex jones is just like a mainstream republican commentator Right. When I'm like old enough to remember when Alex Jones was like on the fringe of the fringe and like he was somebody that everybody laughed at because he was just such a goofy, preposterous character. But now he's like like that represents just like a mainstream faction of the American right. And I think that if there didn't exist this like pre-existing body of rich kind of conspiratorial stuff, you know, like there's this there's like a conspiracy theory canon of like certain villains and narratives and storylines. So I feel like if we could just somehow like expunge all of that from the body politic like if we could go back in time and ensure that there never were any conspiracy theories about the moon landing or the lizard people or the jfk assassination or whatever we'd mm -hmm. probably be better off but i kind of wonder if you talk about that but i wonder if uh if your first condition were met if it would curb a lot of that <clears throat> that if people were a little bit more aware of what's working around them mm. and were a little bit more aware of things they should be grateful for if that would kind of curb a lot of the conspiratorial stuff yeah i think i think that's a that's a fair point right like mm -hmm. if people had a sense that like uh American institutions are are pretty good. Generally, work all things considered, well, yeah. like yeah, then you would be less in, you would be less receptive to the idea that they're actually the font of of evil and they're run by the Rothschild Foundation to enslave humanity or whatever. Yeah, it was very frustrating. Like there's so many things, not to open a whole other topic, but yeah, like people talk about like pharmaceuticals as being these horrible evil companies that do all these horrible evil things. Um, but like HIV is like almost basically at yeah. parity with ordinary living conditions. So there are drugs now where if you have HIV, like you're you're doing better than a person with uh, diabetes, yes. like easily. Um, or that like now, uh, for the first time in like forever, like I think five years ago, I think you could say that there didn't exist a single drug that was being trialed or anything that could ever help with Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And now we're, we've got drugs that are in trial that are showing unbelievable promise. Yeah. Um, and these are the diseases that the pharmaceutical companies were never supposed to touch because yes. they just want to keep you sick forever oh, so yes, that they yes, can, yes, like, yes. yeah. So yeah. yeah I and, wish... it's, and it's, and it's, it's, it's depressing to think that like you imagine the press release of these kind of new miracle drugs being developed, you think of these press releases being posted on Instagram or Twitter, and you can just like imagine what the replies will be. And that is just depressing. The idea that people will not allow themselves <sighs> to be happy or appreciative of enormous 
positive developments for mankind. The way that I phrase this is that like, uh, like nothing can ever happen anymore, ever. Nothing happens. <laughs> nothing is any, is whatever it seems. If there's wildfires in Hawaii, it's yes. Jewish space lasers. Yes. If anything happens anywhere, one of the biggest fucking fears that I have, and it's totally possible, actuarially speaking, that like Trump could die from a variety of things. Yes. If Trump died of anything, it would be like the oh, end of the fucking oh. republic. If he had a heart attack tomorrow or some shit, it'd be over, bro. Let me, let me tell you, Stephen, I once was sort of talking this out with one of my friends, and we were like trying to like imagine a scenario in which Trump dies and it doesn't create a horrible conspiracy theory. <laughs> and the best one we could come up with is like, okay, Trump is touring a factory and somebody is saying like, Mr. President, don't grab that box. And they like tell him repeatedly, don't touch that box. And then Trump does it and all the boxes fall on him and crush him. You would have to have like that level of like unambiguous, like documentary evidence and even then people would say it yeah, was a there, it would be impossible yeah, yeah, yeah that wasn't really trump they killed him a few days yeah, earlier yeah. this wasn't the actual guy yeah it would yeah, be impossible it was, it's impossible like it's not even on some level like <sighs> worth worth thinking about but mm -hmm. yeah i mean taylor swift can't even kiss her boyfriend without it being the source of uh, <laughs> jesus christ yeah oh my god did you ever see the theories online for a long time that she was uh secretly a nazi posting on 4chan yeah i'm sort of vaguely aware <laughs> that that was a thing but i i'm happy to say i didn't dive too deep into it oh jesus <laughs> well hey listen it's been three hours oh, wow. um i super appreciate you joining us uh do you want to give a shout out to your channel where can people find you what do they want to yeah uh sure thanks it was a great conversation Stephen. i had a lot of fun yeah um if people want to look me up uh jj mccullough on youtube mccullough is hard to spell but if you just do jj canada you'll find me pretty easily cool well thanks a lot for joining us i really appreciate it and Thanks. yeah um i know that we live stream all this do we record any of this Okay. Well, because I should do, because I didn't do the ad read during the episode. I also didn't introduce you at all. <laughs> so I could shoot, I we could did. like, what? I think you did. Because I remember you saying my last name. I said, this is JJ McCullough. Oh. I, I might have said like he does YouTube or whatever. I think you did, yeah. Okay, fine. Good enough. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay. if you want to do a better introduction, that's fine. <laughs> well, or I'll do, let me just do ad read and then. Okay. Yeah, and then August could stick it in uh, somewhere, wherever all he right. thinks is appropriate, okay? <clears throat> um. Okay. Start rolling and everything, right? You're good? Okay, I'm doing this now because I forgot to do it in the middle of the episode because the conversation was so much fun. Uh, but we are now sponsored by Ground News. If you go to ground or check.ground.news slash bridges podcast, I'm not going to spell that for you. You should be able to spell it. Um, then you have a promo code for accessing Ground News. Uh, it's a website that gives you kind of this collection of a whole bunch of different media sources. And then it allows you to go through all of the media sources to see how they report on stories, to check for biases on whatever publication, or to just see how different people talk about things. Uh, Kylie uses it for collecting a bunch of news uh, and clips and everything for our show. And I will begin using it because I've been trying to find a place where I can look at a news aggregator that's more than just my subreddit. But make sure you check that out. It is check.ground.news slash Burgess Podcast. The news is divided. Ground News puts it back together with coverage from thousands of outlets around the world in one place. So you can spot sensational reporting no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. Beside every headline, you'll see who owns the source, how reliable it is, and if they have a political bias. Multiple perspectives side by side, giving you a well-rounded view of today's biggest stories. Visit ground.news to learn more.